If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 23, I Am Rich With Raymond taking the first round in such a ruthless way, the group felt a bit uneasy, but they stayed focused on winning the next two rounds. Luckily, Badaro was up next, striding confidently onto the platform. But his confidence waned when he saw the next prisoner. The guy was skinny and looked mean, carrying something wrapped in dark clothes. Badaro's eyebrows shot up in alarm. It seemed this prisoner was serious about the game, and whatever he was hiding under those covers spelled trouble. Wait, isn't he Remy the Swindler? Kenmai's surprise was evident as all eyes turned to him for an explanation. Kenmai flashed a knowing smile as he elaborated, Yep, that's him all right. Remy made quite a name for himself as a con artist. He had a knack for forging famous artworks with a staggering 99% resemblance to the originals. Thing is, Kenmai continued, his tone darkening slightly, his talent wasn't limited to art forgery. He had a twisted hobby of abducting young girls, aged around 14 to 19, A and D. Well, let's just say his intentions weren't noble. Ponzu's expression twisted in disgust at the revelation, her frown deepening with each word. Meanwhile, Raymond and Bourbon remained stoic, their silence speaking volumes as they fixed their gaze on the platform ahead. Hey there, old timer, you look like you've got some muscle on you, he he he. Remy's awkward laugh grated on Badaro's nerves, deepening his frown. Wait just a minute. Remy continued with a mischievous glint in his eye. He revealed what he had in hand, and the group's surprise was evident as they saw two nearly identical paintings. Remy then placed them side by side on the ground, his smirk widening. Hee hee, here's the deal, Remy announced gleefully, I want you to guess which one is the real deal. No time limit, no fancy rules. Silence fell over the group as they realized Remy's game was designed to waste their time completely. Raymond's frown deepened as he examined the paintings, his eyebrows shooting up in surprise as he noticed something unexpected. However, the mood shifted as the others furrowed their brows, their attention drawn to the paintings. One depicted a woman, its style slightly artsy with a minimalist color palette of oranges, yellows, and reds. Badaro's forehead glistened with sweat, caught off guard by the unexpected challenge. He hesitated murmuring to himself, here's hoping luck's on my side. I'll show. None of them are real. But then, Raymond's voice cut through the tension like a knife. Confusion rippled through the group, all eyes turning towards Raymond, searching for an explanation. Yet, despite Raymond's claim, the prisoner's smile remained unfaltering, though a hint of unease flickered in his eyes before he concealed it. Seems like you've got yourself a helper. Well then, make your choice, he urged Badaro his tone smooth as silk. Badaro hesitated, torn between trust and doubt. The swindler's composure was unsettling, refusing to crack even in the face of Raymond's bold statement. Unable to shake off his uncertainty, Badaro finally voiced his question, but if one of them is real, how do we prove it? A confident smirk danced across Remy's lips as he responded, simple. We'll toss them to the ground and see which one breaks. The real one won't shatter. His assurance only deepened Badaro's inner turmoil, leaving him trapped in a web of indecision. Both will crack under pressure. Take my word for it. And how are you planning to prove they're both fakes? Badaro shot back, his gaze fixed on Raymond. Meanwhile, Remy met Raymond's gaze with a subtle challenge. His replicas were flawless, a testament to his mastery of the craft. He'd honed his skills to the point where he could dupe even himself had he not known better. Every stroke, every detail meticulously crafted from his own hand. Let's see you figure that one out, he he he. Remy's eyes twinkled with a mischievous gleam brimming with cunning. Raymond simply shook his head, casting a critical eye over the paintings once more before confirming, yep, those are definitely fakes. And why I'm sure of that? Because I happen to own the genuine one. He dropped the bombshell with an air of nonchalance. Silence fell over the room, each person frozen in disbelief. Remy's eyes bulged in shock as he sputtered, What? That's impossible. One of those paintings alone is worth five billion jenny, and that's just the tip of the iceberg since there's a whole collection of it. What? The revelation sent shockwaves through the group. Raymond couldn't help but smirk at their stunned expressions. So, care to explain how you've got billions worth of artwork in a prison cell? Wait, he's telling the truth. How in the world did a prisoner smuggle in paintings worth billions of jenny? The realization dawned on everyone as they turned sharply to look at Remy, whose face drained of color as he clapped a hand over his mouth in horror at his own oversight. Ah, 
I see. In that case, I declare them both fakes. Bottero roared with laughter, striding over to the paintings and snatching them up before Remy could react. No, stop. Don't do it. Remy pleaded desperately, but Bottero merely chuckled. Fet chance, ha ha ha. Remy's feeble attempts to intervene were no match for Bottero's strength. With a swift motion, the paintings were hurled to the ground, shattering into pieces upon impact. No. Remy could only watch in anguish as he knelt before the shattered remains of his creations, tears streaming down his face. Even though they were fakes, they were still his handiwork. He had never intended for them to be destroyed, his plan had been to admit to both as his own creations and secure a victory in the game. It was supposed to be a win-win situation for him. But someone had ruined everything. You son of a bitch. Remy's gaze shot towards Raymond, his heart boiling with rage. What the fuck, man? None of this would have happened if you hadn't tried to be so clever. Remy's anger blinded him to the fact that Raymond had merely outsmarted him. He jabbed a finger accusingly at Raymond, spitting out his words, and you claim to own them? Are you out of your mind? Do you think you are some kind of rich tycoon? Yet, as the group's gaze fell upon Raymond's impeccably tailored suit, Remy's bravado faltered. He stammered, humph. Even if you are wealthy, money can't buy these. You're just a damn liar. But it was true. No matter how deep your pockets, these paintings weren't something you could simply purchase. They were masterpieces crafted by the legendary hunter da Vinci, and everyone definitely wanted to get their hands on one of them. Most importantly, da Vinci had infused them with his own nun, preserving them for eternity. Raymond's smirk widened in response to Remy's outburst of anger. You caught me. I do lie about having just one of them. Why you? Remy's words caught in his throat as fury coursed through him, causing his body to tremble with rage. But Raymond's next revelation stunned not just Remy but everyone else present. I've got the whole collection set, not just one. The room fell into stunned silence once more as all eyes turned towards Raymond, disbelief written plainly on their faces. With no apparent reason to lie, the truth of his claim began to sink in. Who was this guy? Really? Chapter 24, Towards Tower's End Ignoring the stares from everyone, Raymond simply shook his head as the next prisoner dragged Remy away. It was fortunate for him that he was familiar with those paintings. He often bought such things as investments, and sometimes, he'd sell them at a loss to his other company to lower the company's profits and gain tax benefits. Why did he do this? Well, the banking system in this world was a mess. They printed money like crazy. Even being a hunter came with hefty expenses, sometimes racking up to billions. So Raymond made sure to convert his profits into tangible assets like rare art and diamonds things that wouldn't be affected by the ridiculous inflation caused by the flawed financial system. It was just a smart move to protect his wealth. Ponzu wordlessly ascended the platform, her expression serious as she sized up her opponent. The newcomer, of similar build, shed her robe to reveal a striking woman with cropped dark hair and a martial kimono. Recognition flickered across Ponzu's face as she realized her adversary's identity. Her demeanor shifted to one of solemn acknowledgement. Oh? Seems like you recognize me, little girl. Standing before her was Nohara from Japan, a famed ninja akin to Hanzo. However, unlike Hanzo's path of honor, Nohara had embraced the life of a thief, earning infamy for her exploits across the globe. With a reputation for cunning deceit and unmatched agility, Ponzu braced herself. All right. Let's get straight to the point then. Nohara chuckled as she explained, My game was simple, we're going to try to knock each other out inside my smokes. As Nohara unveiled the game they were playing, a glint of cunning lit up Ponzu's eyes. Ponzu's advantage lies in Nohara's ignorance of her own abilities. Adopting a defensive stance, Ponzu's seemingly passive demeanor almost provoked laughter from Nohara. Undeterred, Nohara proceeded with the game's explanation. With a flourish, she unleashed a thick veil of smoke obscuring the platform from view. The game was on, and anyone caught within the fog and knocked out would be declared the loser. Little did Nohara know, she had unwittingly set the stage for her own downfall. With a sly smirk, Ponzu unleashed her secret weapon. A swarm of buzzing bees. Their strange noises echoed through the haze, catching Nohara off guard. It happened in a flash. Nohara's screams pierced through the thick smoke as a bee found its mark, delivering its painful sting. Before she could react, another followed suit, sending her spiraling into unconsciousness. A single bee sting was tolerable, but the venomous strike of two proved fatal. 
As the smoke dissipated, the platform revealed Ponzu, silent and unmoving, her gaze fixed on Nohara's lifeless form. The other participants regarded Ponzu with newfound wariness. It became clear that she was no ordinary contender. The eerie buzzing of insects had hinted at her deadly arsenal, and now, with Nohara's demise, their suspicions were confirmed. Ponzu was a force to be reckoned with. Fucking useless. Muttered one prisoner, disappointment edged on his face. I thought I'd at least shave a few years off my sentence. The complaints echoed loudly as the game concluded with the participants' victory. With that out of the way, the participants were free to continue their descent down the trick tower. Silence settled over the group as they moved forward, navigating through a labyrinth of traps and obstacles. Surprisingly, the challenges seemed fairly manageable for all of them. Raymond kept pace with the others, observing the subtle shift in their demeanor. It seemed they had grown wary of him, a fact that slightly amused him. After navigating through hours of traps and obstacles, they finally arrived at a pair of imposing doors. Lippo's voice echoed around them, Well, well, well. Welcome, everyone. These doors mark the final hurdle of your test. Congratulations on making it this far. His chuckle filled the air as he continued, Now, these two doors, press X for the door on your right, offering an easier and shorter path, or O for the left door, a harder and longer route. The group remained unimpressed, fully aware that there was a catch. Lippo's laughter grew even louder, his amusement evident. But here's the kicker, the easier path can only accommodate three people. The rest had to be shackled to the walls to open it. And the harder path would get you through in 45 hours regardless of how fast you were going. He he he, then, which door will you choose? He teased as his laugh echoed through the room. The group fell into a tense silence each member exchanging wary glances before collectively focusing on one person. They've figured out I'm the biggest threat, hey? Pretty sharp. Raymond chuckled, noting the weight of their stares with a hint of amusement. Bottero stepped in, shaking his head, let's calm down, guys. Check your timers. We still have 63 hours left. No need to fight over something so trivial. We can all get what we want without causing a scene, he reasoned directing their attention to their wristwatches. A moment of quiet contemplation followed Bottero's words. Slowly, the tension dissipated as the group seemed to agree with his logic. Considering how smoothly they'd navigated through the traps, Bottero's suggestion made sense. Yet, yeah, Bottero's onto something. I'm with Bottero, Ponzu, and Ken Mai nodded in agreement. Bourbon just shrugged, showing he was on board too. I'll leave the decision to you, Raymond said, smiling as everyone turned to him. With Raymond on board, the tension melted away, and they all visibly relaxed. His words might have sounded like an order, but in the moment, they were just glad to have a decision made. But there is no rule saying we can't just force the door open by ourselves, right? Bottero suggested, laughing heartily. It dawned on the others that this was indeed a viable option. With a grin, Bottero strode towards the door marked as the easier path. He took a deep breath, then swung his fist at the door with all his might creating a loud thud that made some of them flinch. What? To Bottero's surprise, his punch didn't even make a scratch on the door. Undeterred, he tried again and again, but the door remained stubbornly intact, frustrating his efforts. Bottero turned to Raymond with a wry smile, young man, care to give it a shot. Raymond was taken aback by the unexpected offer. He hadn't anticipated Bottero's invitation since it might have hurt his pride, but he was willing to try. A wise and humble old man, hey. Raymond nodded at Bottero who just smiled at him. They shook their head as they mentally prepared themselves to tackle the harder route, not expecting Raymond to be able to open it up. However. Bam. A deafening blast echoed through the chamber, causing them all to turn and stare in astonishment. A massive hole had been blasted open, revealing not only the easier route but also the harder one. Their jaws dropped in disbelief as they watched Raymond's nonchalant figure. Let's move. Chapter 25, The Fourth Phase Finally reaching the bottom of the trick tower, the group let out collective sighs of relief as they stepped into the waiting room. One by one, their names were called out. Bottero took the lead, claiming the eighth spot. Then, it was Raymond's turn. And in twelfth place, number 406, Raymond. Silence greeted Raymond's entrance, save for the amused chuckle from Hisoka, who had arrived earlier. Seems like you're quite late, Hisoka remarked, his gaze fixed on Raymond. Ignoring the exchange, Raymond scanned the room, 
spotting a few familiar faces, including Gitteracker. But to his dismay, there wasn't a single chair in sight. With a resigned sigh, Raymond found a corner to settle in. Closing his eyes, he waited patiently for the rest of the participants to finish their exams. As Gon's group battled their way through the challenges, they eventually emerged victorious, albeit with a penalty for betting on their time an additional 50 hours added to their tally. Luckily, they had enough time to spare, thanks to Gon's clever decision to take the easier path, much like Raymond's group. Oh, Raymond. Gon and Killua waved excitedly at Raymond, who greeted them with a smile. They began to regale him with tales of their recent adventures, their enthusiasm infectious which prompted everyone to look their way. As expected of you, that should be a breeze, Karapika acknowledged with a nod. Raymond chuckled, I've got some pretty great teammates. You're lucky. One of my teammates is a useless, grumpy old man. Leorio grumbled in response. His complaint drew chuckles from those nearby, except Tanpa, who retorted, Don't forget who made us wait for 50 hours. The exchange sparked a bickering match between Leorio and Tanpa, attracting the interest of the onlookers. As tensions simmered and the bickering threatened to escalate, Lippo emerged from his observation room, effectively diffusing the situation. He congratulated the participants on passing the third phase of the hunter exam and then guided them out of the tower. He then explained the next phase, set to take place on Zivil Island. Lippo assured them that transportation would be provided by the association as he handed out cards to each participant, each containing a target number. Each person's own badge counted for three points, as did their assigned target's badge. The other badges, apart from theirs and their target, were only worth one point each. And, the goal was straightforward. Gather up a total of six points. Understanding the rules of the game, everyone quickly stashed away their badge numbers for safekeeping. With their target numbers in hand, they prepared for the next phase of the exam. Some wore furrowed brows, others displayed hints of satisfaction, while most adopted a nonchalant demeanor, masking their emotions behind a poker face. Number 80 Hey. Raymond murmured as he recalled the red-haired female participant among them. He had meticulously memorized the badge numbers of all 25 participants who had made it through to the fourth phase. Number 80 belonged to Cyper, a competent sniper with no remarkable traits beyond her skills. With a nod of acknowledgement, Raymond immediately crushed the target card in his hand to pieces. As the ship finally arrived, everyone quickly boarded and they set sail towards Civil Island. As they sailed across the sea, a guide congratulated them on passing the third phase and provided them with essential information for the journey ahead. However, amidst the guide's instructions, the attention of everyone seemed to be focused on a particular individual, namely Raymond. The reason for their attention was mainly because. Raymond, why haven't you taken off your badge like everyone else? Gon asked curiously, eyeing Raymond's badge number still neatly pinned to his suit. Killua was intrigued as he leaned in. He himself had hidden his badge just in case. So, Raymond's act had piqued his interest. My regular pockets and some customized ones in my vest were already packed, so I just left it there. Raymond explained. Full? What are you carrying? Weapons. Killua inquired sounding genuinely curious. Raymond recognized Killua's question as a way to gather information about potential threats within the exam, including himself. He chuckled before replying, I brought some spices. Hey. Gon and Killua blinked in surprise, their expressions puzzled. Did I hear that correctly? We're heading into a life or death situation, and he's worried about spices. He seems wealthy, probably clueless about real challenges in life. The murmurs of disapproval echoed among the other participants, excluding Raymond's former group members in the last phase. Noticing the judgmental glances from the others, Ilumi and Hisoka remained silent, observing quietly. Meanwhile, Raymond was unperturbed by the criticism and simply chuckled at Gon and Killua's further questions and patiently answered them. Stranded on a deserted island, Raymond had thought ahead and brought along a supply of spices. Considering his past as a beggar. Even when he had only experienced it through inherited memories, Raymond had developed a strong taste for flavorful food and refused to settle for bland meals or scrounge around the island for seasoning. Unconcerned about the possibility of others targeting his badge number. In fact, Raymond even welcomed any potential challengers. And talking about the one targeting his number, Raymond just shook his head. During the distribution of target numbers by Lippo, Raymond couldn't help but notice an intense stare directed his way from someone he knew quite well. Sensing the subtle glance directed at him, he turned his gaze. With a knowing smile, Raymond met Kenmai's eyes, 
causing the latter to visibly tense up. It was clear that Raymond was aware of who had their sights set on him. He knows. Ken Mai silently exclaimed in his mind, shaking his head in frustration. Realizing that he had been too obvious when examining the target card earlier, Ken Mai cursed his own foolishness. He understood that Raymond's strength far surpassed his own. I suppose I'll have to target three people instead. Recognizing that he stood little chance against Raymond's formidable abilities, Ken Mai sighed inwardly and made a silent decision. As the ship finally docked on a small pathway alongside the island, everyone peered eagerly at the unfamiliar terrain. All right, now it's time to disembark one by one, starting with the contestant who took the least time to complete the third phase. Their guide, Kara, announced. We'll wait for two minutes between each participant, she continued, ensuring fairness. Nodding in agreement, the contestants watched as Hisoka was beckoned forward to begin his journey. Only twenty minutes, hey. Raymond murmured, eyeing Gitaraker as he ventured onto the island after two minutes had passed. A smirk tugged at Raymond's lips, plenty of time to cover his tracks. But it's making my hunt all the more interesting, he added, excitement sparking in his eyes. Chapter 26, A Pathfinder Next up, please. Finally, it was his turn. Raymond stepped forward, bidding farewell to Gon and Killua, who waved enthusiastically. With a shake of his head, Raymond headed into the forest. As he entered, he was greeted by a lush green landscape teeming with wildlife. The sunlight filtered through the dense trees, casting shadows on the ground. The chirping of birds, leaf rustling, and distant calls of wild creatures create a peaceful atmosphere. After hours of walking through the vibrant forest, Raymond finally reached a towering tree. He leaped from branch to branch with agility and skill, swiftly going up to the treetop. Hmm. This island seems much larger than I anticipated, Raymond remarked, surveying the sprawling greenery before him. Raymond's brow furrowed in frustration as he surveyed his surroundings. Despite his keen senses and wide range of perception, he couldn't detect any trace of the rat he was looking for, Ilumi Zaldik. I guess it was given that he was this cautious, Raymond muttered to himself. The rat was, after all, a capable assassin. Despite his efforts, he couldn't find any signs of Ilumi Zaldik who was using the alias Gitteracker. Tracking wasn't truly his strong suit, as he didn't have any related abilities. He was usually confident in his perceptions, but they seemed to fail him in this situation. Raymond wondered if he had underestimated Zaldik or if luck simply wasn't on his side this time. As Raymond prepared to leave the tree, he caught sight of movement nearby. Turning his head, he spotted a woman with long red hair carefully searching the ground. It was his target, number number 80, Cyper. A smirk tugged at Raymond's lips as he observed her. Oh? Don't blame me for this. You brought this upon yourself. With his crimson eyes gleaming, he chuckled softly. Without bothering to conceal his presence, Raymond leaped from the tree. The sudden movement caused a branch to snap loudly, startling Cyper. She turned towards the noise, her eyes widening as she spotted Raymond's figure descending towards her. But Raymond's calm demeanor didn't match Cyper's surprise. I would appreciate it if you don't stare too much, please. He smiled casually, his voice cutting through the tension. Cyper was immediately snapped back from her reverie before she hastily leaped backwards and created some distance between herself and Raymond. Asterisk click. With a swift motion, she raised her sniper rifle and fired at Raymond's head decisively. Oh. But Raymond simply tilted his head, effortlessly dodging the bullet. What in the world? Cyper's shock was evident in her wide-eyed stare. She had underestimated Raymond, assuming him to be nothing more than a pampered rich guy, especially after his odd choice to prioritize spices on the ship. But she had witnessed so far was totally out of her expectations. His chuckle sent shivers down her spine as she realized her mistake. I thought you were the reserved type, but it seems I was mistaken. You're quite fierce, lady. Raymond's words were unervingly calm, and Cyper felt a sense of impending danger creeping over her. Instinctively, she knew she was in over her head. She finally grasped the truth. He's dangerous. Raymond was not to be underestimated. He was far stronger and more dangerous than she had ever imagined. I didn't realize you were good up close, too. Interesting. Raymond remarked, raising an eyebrow as he watched Cyper switch her sniper for two military knives and take a defensive stance. Sweat dripped down Cyper's forehead as she realized relying solely on her sniper at close range would be dangerous. All right, lady. I'll play along, Raymond chuckled. In an instant, 
he disappeared from view, leaving Cyper wide-eyed. Suddenly, she felt a sharp blow to her stomach. The impact sent her tumbling to the ground, where she doubled over as her face contorted in pain before she vomited whatever she had eaten that day. Raymond lowered his feet, eyeing Cyper's figure with a nod. Very good, you're quite resilient, he remarked, his voice echoing in her mind like a specter. Gritting her teeth against the pain, Cyper dashed towards him as she hoped to catch him off guard. But Raymond was too quick to reach as he casually evaded her knife jab and countered with a powerful punch to her face. Ugh. Cyper groaned in pain as she was sent flying into the trees before tumbling to the ground. I respect your attempt, but hate to say that won't be enough, Raymond shook his head, a mix of respect and disappointment in his eyes. Cyper winced in agony, her body quivering from Raymond's relentless assault. Gritting her teeth, she managed to croak out, I know that won't do the trick. Raymond cocked his head, puzzled. You should have taken me out with one hit. A metallic clinking caught Raymond's attention as he glanced downward. There, on the ground, lay a small object. You fool. Cyper's voice taunted him again, dripping with scorn. Before Raymond could react, the object suddenly exploded, releasing a thick cloud of smoke that obscured his vision and filled the area with disorientation. Quite the trickster, isn't she? Raymond muttered to himself as the smoke gradually dissipated, revealing no sign of Cyper, which had slipped away right after her smoke grenade exploded. But instead of frustration, a sly grin played on Raymond's lips a reaction Cyper might hadn't anticipated. She's got some skill, that's for sure. With a shake of his head, Raymond revealed a card in his palm, the very one Lippo had provided to identify the target number. His smirk widened, nicely done. Looks like her target was indeed number number 301. It was Cyper's card. Initially, Raymond had his doubts. Was Gitteracker really Cyper's target this time around? He remembered her fate in the original storyline, and it should have been the case. But it was better to be safe than sorry since his presence might have changed everything. So, he had to be sneaky, swiftly grabbing the card from her without her noticing. Those kicks and punches were just a means to make sure she was a capable pawn, someone who could potentially lead him to his real target Illumi Zaldik. That after all, was one of the reasons he joined the hunter exam in the first place. Closing his eyes, Raymond honed his perception. His crimson eyes sparkled with a devious light when he opened them again. Let's see if she can lead me to the rat. Raymond's presence slowly faded away, his figure immediately blending into the surroundings. Silently, he moved toward the direction Cyper had darted off to while she remained oblivious to the fact that she was unwittingly dancing in the palm of his hand. Chapter 27, Confronting the Rat Cyper caught her breath as she huddled behind a massive boulder. Pain rippled through her body, etching lines of agony on her face. She couldn't shake off the memory of the recent close call. I've had some close ones, but that was too close, she muttered, wincing at the ache. Where did that strong guy even come from? Shaking her head, Cyper winced, still feeling the lingering effects of the one-sided beating she endured. I was lucky to slip away using that trick. She muttered as a shiver running down her spine at the memory. She then scanned her surroundings warily before deciding it was safe to proceed. With a sigh, she stripped off her clothes, revealing a sizable bruise on her stomach that had turned to a deep shade of blue. Erg. She winced, knowing it would be a pain for weeks. Her face bore a few bruises from Raymond's punches, but she shrugged them off. At this point, her appearance was the least of her worries. It's enough to keep me going, she muttered to herself rummaging through her bag until she found a bottle of painkillers. Downing the maximum dose, she grimaced at the bitter taste but knew it was necessary to dull the pain. Cyper rested her head against the large stone, feeling a sense of relief as the pain gradually lessened. Although still present, it was now manageable and wouldn't hinder her movements. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to her, Raymond observed her from afar as he leaned against a nearby tree with a furrowed brow. Looks like I went too far, he muttered realizing he had dealt Cyper a heavy blow. Expecting her to take a short break before continuing her search, he shook his head in mild regret. But did he regret hitting a woman so hard? Not exactly. After twelve years in this world, gender didn't factor much into fights. It was all about winners and losers. With that in mind, Raymond stayed hidden, observing Cyper from the shadows. Time passed slowly until he noticed she slowly made some movements, indicating she was ready to continue her tracking. Raymond's crimson eyes remained fixed on Cyper as he trailed her silently from the shadow, staying hidden as she moved forward. She was completely unaware of his presence. 
Time dragged on, with minutes feeling like hours, and hours stretching into a full day. Cyper's frustration grew evident as she struggled to pick up any leads on her target. Raymond observed her closely, his expression turning into a frown. Can she even do this? He muttered doubtfully, his uncertainty growing with each passing moment. However, as if answering his doubt. Cyper's expression suddenly shifted as she had seemingly spotted something. Raymond quickly extended his senses outward, detecting subtle movements nearby. He watched as Cyper made her way to a higher vantage point with a frown before his expression eased. Consider this my fee for the service, with a sigh, Raymond shook his head. Meanwhile, Ilumi who was still disguised as Gitteracker, leaned against a tree. He was idly twirling a needle in one hand while conversing on a communication device held in the other. Do you know who your target is? He murmured into the device, his voice barely above a whisper. Meanwhile, Cyper had positioned herself in a prime vantage point, her sniper rifle trained directly on Illumi's head. No, I don't. Do you want me to tell you? Illumi's demeanor shifted suddenly, his gaze sharpening as he continued speaking with Hisoka through the device, realizing they had an unexpected visitor. I don't care about that. I'm more interested in finding someone. Someone? Yes, someone I badly wanted to fight with. Ilumi's brow furrowed in confusion as he heard Hisoka's sudden crazed laughter through the communication device before the line went dead. Shaking his head, Ilumi dismissed the odd exchange and refocused on his surroundings. Cyper smiled as she thought she had the upper hand before she froze in shock as Ilumi swiftly turned his head toward her. What? In a split second, he swung the needle in his hand at her with such speed that even a bullet wouldn't have a chance. Clang! A loud metallic sound rang out as Cyper stumbled backward landing hard on the ground. She watched in disbelief as Illumi's needle was deflected by a kitchen knife, bouncing into the air before being caught by a hand. Why you? Well, what a surprise. Raymond's calm voice interrupted the tension as he examined the needle closely, noting a faint hint of Nan, likely tied to Illumi's abilities. Hey! Illumi frowned as he witnessed his attack being blocked by the very person he had been most cautious of in the hunter exam. Meanwhile, Cyper stood stunned amazed that the one targeting her had just stepped in to save her. This isn't charity. You owe me. Hand over your badge. Raymond's voice was calm but resolute. Pardon. Cyper's confusion was evident. I won't repeat myself. With a reluctant sigh, Cyper clenched her jaw and surrendered her badge to Raymond. Wise choice. Raymond spoke as he casually added it beside his own on his suit. Despite her hesitation, she couldn't deny that Raymond had just saved her life. Without a word, she started to walk away, noticing Raymond's focus shift to her original target, Gitteracker. She knew trouble was brewing as she completely ignored Raymond's odd sense of fashion of displaying the badge side by side. Without uttering a single word, Raymond channeled his nan into the needle, devouring Illumi's nan. And with a swift motion, he sent the needle hurtling through the air towards Illumi, who leaped to dodge it. Asterisk boom. A deafening boom echoed through the area as the spot where Illumi had been standing moments ago was obliterated by Raymond's attack, leaving behind a deep crater with the needle lodged at its center. I don't remember having any issues with you, Illumi's voice rang out as he watched Raymond's figure vanish, only to reappear directly in front of him. Raymond shook his head, toying with the kitchen knife in his hand before speaking. You took a job to kill one of my guys, and yet you're bold enough to talk like this. Fits the Zaldik style. Illumi's eyes widened in surprise at Raymond's sharp words. You know who I am. Why else would I be here? With that, Raymond disappeared again, and Illumi followed suit as a loud clash rang out. The impact sent shockwaves rippling through the forest. Who are they? Cyper was affected by the shockwave as she hastily moved for a cover. She felt a chill run down her spine as she watched the absurd clash unfold before her eyes, leaving her numb with disbelief. Chapter 28, Collision on the other side of the island. Gon was patiently following Hisoka, who seemed to be lost in thought. Suddenly, Gon felt a jolt, and his gaze snapped in a certain direction. What's this feeling? Even though he didn't understand what was happening, his instincts screamed at him to run. Hisoka also seemed to sense it. His usual bored expression shifted into one of alertness, his mind whirling with thoughts as he tried to make sense of the situation. It has to be these two. A twisted expression of delight spread across Hisoka's face as he realized the only two individuals capable of emitting such intense pressure must have encountered each other. Ah! 
Gon couldn't help but shiver as he heard Hisoka emit an eerie sound filled with a strange mix of excitement and anticipation. Should he follow Hisoka toward the source of danger, or would it be wiser to stay put? I've got to pass this exam, Gon whispered to himself, determination filling his voice as he steeled himself. With resolve in his eyes, he decided to follow Hisoka. Asterisk clang. The clash between Raymond's knife and Illumi's needles reverberated through the forest with a resounding clang. Thernan intertwined in a violent energy that unleashed devastating shockwaves, reducing the surrounding landscape to ruin with them at its center. Feeling his opponent's nan seemed to have devoured his, Illumi's body tensed. He immediately let go of the needles in his hand as he vanished from Raymond's line of sight, leaving only a fleeting disturbance in the air. Raymond's acute senses detected the subtle shift, allowing him to narrowly evade Illumi's subsequent attack. However, Illumi's aggression didn't end there. With lightning speed, he launched a ferocious kick towards Raymond's figure. Seeing the kick coming his way, Raymond's reflexes kicked in as his hand intercepted the blow mere moments before it could make contact, the force of the impact coursing through his frame. Illumi seemed to be surprised his kick didn't send Raymond's figure flying. Yet, Illumi suddenly sensed an imminent danger as he swiftly retreated, putting considerable distance between himself and Raymond, his gaze ablaze with a predatory intensity. Why? You scared? Raymond's casual taunt cut through the tense atmosphere, met only by Illumi's silent stare. Illumi lightly stole a quick glance at his feet as he felt numbness feeling. He knew his bone cracked just from the clash, evidence of Raymond's overpowering strength. Illumi couldn't help but acknowledge the raw power his opponent wielded. Who are you? Though his voice was plain, Illumi was in fact, in a state of disbelief. In his family, only his father surpassed him in sheer strength. Raised within the rigorous training regimen of the Zaldik family, Illumi possessed a range of abilities, resistance to poisons, tolerance to electricity, agility, and strength. His combat skills, both armed and unarmed, were finely honed through years of experience. Yet, despite his formidable skills, he found himself outmatched by an unexpected opponent encountered during the hunter exam. What unnerved him most was Raymond's ability to track his lightning-fast movements with ease, a sensation that sent a shiver down Illumi's spine. Something he hadn't felt in years. Me. Raymond's chuckle broke the tension. In a blink, he vanished from Illumi's view. Illumi's eyes shook as he sensed danger, but before he could react, a sharp kick found its mark in his abdomen, sending him stumbling back in a desperate attempt to create space. Yet Raymond pressed on, swiftly closing the gap as he declared, I'm a pest control technician. Ignoring the sarcasm in Raymond's words, Illumi lashed out with a kick of his own, realizing there was no solid ground to stand on in mid-air. But Raymond evaded with surprising agility, catching Illumi off guard. Seizing the moment, Raymond closed in and landed a devastating blow, sending Illumi crashing to the forest floor with a deafening thud. A cloud of dust billowed around the impact site, momentarily obscuring Raymond's vision. With a deft twirl of his kitchen knife, he remained focused on the crater, anticipating Illumi's next move. Raymond chuckled as the dust slowly settled, revealing Illumi's actual form as he slowly peeled off the needles in his hand. You're tougher than I expected for an assassin. Though he was surprised that his kick hadn't broken Illumi's hand, Raymond knew Illumi's hand should be cracked despite the protection of Illumi's nan. A tense silence settled between them as Illumi's face returned to normal, locking eyes once again with Raymond's crimson gaze. Which one among my target was your man? The question hung heavy in the air as Illumi's mind raced for a solution. Direct confrontation was a clear disadvantage for him since his nan-type was manipulation. In order for his ability to take effect, his needles had to be deeply embedded in his opponent, a feat impossible in a head-on clash against Raymond. This guy. Illumi's gaze narrowed as it settled on Raymond, whose impeccably clean suit betrayed no sign of the chaos around them, he's way more dangerous than I thought. Instead of answering, Raymond's expression suddenly shifted. A hint of dissatisfaction clouded his features as he shook his head. As I expected. His words were barely a whisper as he glanced at the kitchen knife in his hand, eventually tucking it back into his vest. Turning his attention back to Illumi, Raymond suddenly found himself alone, the assassin having vanished from sight. With a subtle tilt of his head, Raymond narrowly evaded Illumi's hand, which was now seemingly transformed into a deadly weapon with veins protruding and nails sharpened. Looking at how Illumi manipulated his muscles to form a deadly weapon out of his bare hand made Raymond raise his eyebrows. Nevertheless, Raymond merely smirked, it's a bit clumsy wielding a kitchen knife in combat. I'll stick to my fists. Unfazed by Raymond's commentary, Illumi continued his relentless assault, 
their clash decimating the surrounding environment with each blow. Yet, as the battle raged on, Illumi came to a startling realization. Raymond was only employing basic Nan techniques. And he was still overpowering him. The revelation struck Illumi like a bolt of lightning, Illumi's eyes widening in disbelief, contrasting with his nonchalance during the whole fight. Reacting swiftly, he took out his needles seemingly out of nowhere, brandishing them with precision toward Raymond. With a nimble dodge, Raymond narrowly evaded the attack, affording Illumi a moment to put some distance between them. Silently looking at Raymond's pristine suit amidst the chaos, Illumi's mind raced with urgency. I've got to get out of here. Chapter 29, Unwelcomed Visitor As a Zaldik, Illumi had spent his entire life honing his skills as a hunter. He was the predator, always stalking his prey with lethal precision. But now, the roles were reversed. For the first time, Illumi found himself in the position of the hunted, his mind racing as Raymond closed in on him with deliberate steps. Considering Raymond's apparent importance, Illumi racked his brain, trying to recall the few high-profile targets he had recently eliminated. Most of them had been carefully chosen, with Illumi ensuring he had all the necessary background information before making his move. Yet, ultimately, Illumi cared little about the identities of those he killed. As long as the payment was received, their lives held little significance to him. A name suddenly popped into Illumi's head, a person with a mysterious background that didn't quite fit his status. Most people with high standing usually had a clear background after all. Was your guy the new mafia boss in your new city? Illumi's voice was measured, his body bracing for Raymond's response. Raymond's eyebrows lifted in surprise, and he paused in his tracks. After a moment, he chuckled and replied, could be. Though Raymond didn't outright confirm it, Illumi's gut told him he was right. The pieces were starting to come together. This guy isn't your average Joe, Illumi muttered, effortlessly conjuring needles seemingly out of nowhere. Considering the caliber of Raymond's subordinate, Illumi realized the man before him was no pushover. He definitely had some serious backing. Doubt he's stupid enough to tangle with a Zaldik, Illumi thought to himself, resolving to uncover the man's identity later. After this, I'll take down every last one of your lackeys. Illumi's voice was chillingly cold. With three needles gripped between each finger on both hands, he was ready for whatever came next. Still considering the current situation, Illumi pondered changing his commission-accepting tactics to avoid running into troublesome individuals like Raymond in the future. Despite the uncertainty surrounding Raymond's abilities, including the potential use of his unknown Hatsu, Illumi remained confident in his ability to survive. Even though Raymond's nan seemed to overpower his own, Illumi was certain he could make it out of the battle in one piece. While Raymond's attention seemed dedicated to his clash with Illumi, his senses were sharply monitoring the people encircling them who observed their battle closely. These individuals wore black suits, sunglasses, and earpieces. Their tense postures betray their efforts to blend into the surroundings and avoid the shockwaves of the battle. That old man sure is going all out in monitoring me. Raymond knew they were hunters from the Hunter Association. Aware of Netero's shrewdness, he was certain the old man would employ every means at his disposal to keep a watchful eye on him. Let's see, Raymond muttered, taking a step back to dodge Illumi's incoming needles as both fighters vanished from sight. Their battle raged on, with Raymond swiftly evading the flying projectiles aimed at him. With a quick maneuver, he knocked Illumi's wrist, causing him to lose control of the needles. But Illumi was quick to counter, launching more needles while dodging Raymond's attacks. Yet, in the blink of an eye, Raymond appeared beside him as he delivered a powerful blow that sent Illumi crashing through the trees, smashing through dozens of them without pause. Illumi blocked a kick aimed at his head with his hand without changing his expression. Raymond pressed on, his figure darting towards Illumi sprawled on the forest floor, aiming to deliver a decisive stomp upon him. But before Raymond's foot could make contact, Illumi vanished. Asterisk boom. The impact of Raymond's stomp echoed loudly as it crashed into the ground, leaving behind a gaping crater where Illumi had once been. Observers from the Hunter Association couldn't help but gulp nervously at the display of power. Illumi reappeared a short distance away from Raymond, his hand flailing in pain, broken and useless. His emotionless expression was directed at Raymond before his form blurred into action as he went aggressive to counterattack. Oh? That's kinda cute. Raymond remarked with a hint of amusement in his voice. He skillfully dodged each of Illumi's incoming needles. However, Illumi persisted as he kept launching a barrage of kicks and punches in rapid succession. Hmm. Raymond's attention was suddenly drawn away as he swiftly stepped back to avoid a sudden gust of wind aimed at his head. 
His eyes narrowed as he observed the impact on a nearby tree. A bullet. Taking advantage of Raymond's distraction, Illumi silently appeared at Raymond's side, delivering a powerful kick that sent Raymond flying through the trees. Illumi almost broke his emotionless facade. He was surprised that his sneak attack didn't catch Raymond off guard. Illumi noticed Raymond had quickly raised his hand to block the kick he sent. Meanwhile, Raymond quickly regained his footing. He was frowning as he turned to face Illumi. Sigh. With a slight tilt of his head, Raymond effortlessly evaded another bullet. His gaze sharply caught onto the source of the attack. Sure enough, Sniper's figure was visible in the distance, ready to snipe him from afar. Is that your ability? Raymond noticed some needles lodged between her forehead as he turned to look at Illumi with a serious expression. Illumi remained silent, causing Raymond to shake his head once more. Well, you're pretty clever. I suppose that's why you've managed to survive this long as an assassin. Raymond complimented as he drew his knife, swiftly sending it flying towards Cyper. To his surprise, she didn't flinch at his attack as she calmly shot at him once more, prompting Raymond to sidestep. Seizing the opportunity, Illumi launched another attack, forcing Raymond to leap backward to put some distance between them. Meanwhile, Cyper's head suddenly flew off as Raymond's knife struck her neck with deadly precision. No more distractions now. Raymond's voice cut through the tension, sending a chill down Illumi's spine as he scrambled to devise a plan. His senses were keenly aware of the hunters surrounding them. With a determined resolve, Illumi retrieved his needles once more, casting aside thoughts of the hunter exam and using them as a decoy instead. Raymond's figure blurred, appearing right before him in an instant. Illumi's eyes suddenly gleamed with a cunning light as he dodged Raymond's attack before retaliating with a powerful strike from his other hand. Raymond's brow furrowed, managing to evade the hand that was protruding with muscle and sharp nails a sickening crack resonated through the forest as he struck Illumi's hand. Now, rendering both of Illumi's hands useless. What the hell are you doi? Raymond's words were cut short as someone suddenly appeared, causing his pupils to dilate in surprise. He instinctively raised his hand to block the incoming kick aimed at him. But before Raymond could comprehend what was happening, the attacker smirked and vanished. Instead of the anticipated kick, Raymond felt a powerful punch slam into his face, sending him crashing through the forest floor, engulfing the area in a cloud of dust. I don't remember inviting a clown to the party. Slowly rising to his feet, Raymond fixed his gaze on his assailant. Am I not allowed to invite myself? Hisoka replied with a mischievous grin playing across his face. Chapter 30, Gaze of the Sovereign Lightly brushing off the dust from his suit, Raymond's expression remained cold as he locked eyes with Hisoka, who appeared eager for a fight as he sighed. Suddenly, Nan erupted from Raymond's body, engulfing the raised battleground around him in a terrifying aura. His crimson eyes suddenly glowed with intensity. Hisoka couldn't help but feel his body tremble under the overwhelming pressure of Raymond's dominating Nan. Such beautiful eyes. Hisoka felt a shiver crawl down his spine as he locked eyes with Raymond's captivating crimson gaze. It was as if Raymond could see right through him, stripping him of anything. His face twisted into a strange expression as he struggled to bear the weight of the terrifying aura. Meanwhile, Raymond looked at his surroundings with his glowing eyes and furrowed his brows in contemplation, sacrificing his other arm to distract me from the clown's attack was pretty clever. With his eyes illuminated, Raymond could see every trace of Nan around him. He noticed that the purple aura which represented Illumi's Nan had swiftly severed. That assassin had cut off his aura node and vanished during the chaos. This was one of Raymond's Nan abilities. In the past, he could only unleash it instinctively when his life hung in the balance. It took years of practice until he could control it at will. His special eyes required a strong mind to handle the strain of their usage. They allowed him to sharpen his perception, granting him unmatched clarity and the ability to take in every detail without missing a thing. And in recent years, when he trained his Hatsu, Raymond discovered that he could enhance his unique eyes even further by infusing his eyes with his Nan, as he called it. Gaze of the Sovereign. That's why I hate assassins. They flee the moment their lives are threatened, yet they still harbor vengeance. It was a characteristic Raymond despised, one that often defined the nature of assassins. Raymond shook his head, a cunning gleam lighting up his eyes as his crimson eyes slowly dimmed, well it's not like I was trying to kill him in the first place anyway. A chuckle escaped him, everything unfolding according to his calculated plan. Yet, his satisfaction turned to mild annoyance as he glanced at Hisoka. Forget it, a couple of surprises won't hurt. Raymond had expected their fight to be conspicuous, given the widespread destruction in the forest. Still, 
he hadn't anticipated Hisoka would go as far as using Zetsu to mask his presence and land an unexpected hit. Hisoka's grin widened in response. Meanwhile, not far from the battlefield, Garapika and Leorio observed with a mix of shock and surprise. Having just wrapped up their skirmish against Tanpa and Sami, they were taken aback by the loud commotion echoing from the nearby forest and went there to check it out. I thought I'd seen it all, Leorio muttered, swallowing nervously as he realized the battle unfolding before him far exceeded anything he had witnessed before. It surpassed even Raymond's clash with Hisoka in the Swindler's Swamp. Karapika also agreed as they witnessed Hisoka's sneak attack as they all turned solemn. From the outset of the hunter exam, Raymond had caught Karapika's attention with his distinct appearance, particularly his piercing crimson eyes that made him shaken. Yet, despite his initial curiosity, Karapika quickly dismissed the notion that Raymond could be from the Kurta clan since he never had any acquaintance among his village that looked like Raymond, leaving Karapika slightly disappointed. However, as Raymond emanating a pressure enveloping the surroundings, both of them felt shaken to his core. Leorio stumbled backward, his heart pounding in his chest as he landed on his butt. He was trembling with fear. He fought to control his breathing, the urge to flee almost overwhelming. On the side, Karapika's eyes widened in surprise as they unconsciously began to glow, revealing his scarlet eyes. In that moment, Karapika's fear was overshadowed by the intensity of his beating heart as he felt a mixture of awe and uncertainty. Is he? Karapika couldn't help but notice the difference in their eyes. His own were a brighter shade of red compared to Raymond's darker hue. Yet, despite this distinction, a glimmer of hope stirred within him at the sight of their similar gaze. Leorio, Karapika. A whisper cut through the tension, causing Leorio to jump and nearly lose his composure. He turned towards Gon, his expression a mixture of relief and anger as he delivered a sharp smack to Gon's face. Don't scare me like that, you little brat. Eh? I didn't mean to. Don't talk back to me. Gon, did you come to see what's going on too? Karapika inquired while Gon was rubbing the back of his head. Gon shook his head, no, I was just following Hisoka. Is Hisoka your target then? Karapika's eyes widened in realization. Gon fell silent, and Karapika sighed, You're quite unlucky. Well, why not try to get other numbers instead? Leorio suggested, shaking his head sympathetically. No, this might be Gon's chance to get Hisoka's number. Karapika interrupted, prompting Leorio to tilt his head in confusion. Gon nodded seriously, confirming Karapika's observation. As they watched the impending clash unfold before them, Karapika continued, if Raymond can defeat Hisoka, Gon might get a free pass. Wait, so we're gonna spend more time here. Leorio's face went pale at the prospect of staying longer on such a dangerous battlefield. He would have preferred a quick exit since he was not quite sure of the consequences if they were caught. If you two want to leave, feel free. I'll try to get close and, if possible, grab his number during their fight, Gon said while shaking his head. Karapika frowned before saying, I'll stick around just in case. Feeling pressured to stay, Leorio reluctantly nodded. Then, I'll stay as well. He swallowed nervously, resigned to staying with his friends despite his apprehension. With a nod of determination between Karapika and Gon, they slowly moved closer as Leorio clearly shook his head to refute their nod as he followed their steps. Leave him to me. He's mine, Hisoka declared suddenly. This caused Raymond to look at him with a puzzled expression before shaking his head, you must have lost your mind to not see that the rat slipped away because of you. Hey! As Hisoka turned to find any sight of Illumi, his expression froze. He was too excited that he didn't realize that Illumi had used him as a distraction to escape. Chapter 31, Confronting the Trickster Not a very funny joke for a clown, Raymond remarked, shaking his head. Hisoka's so-called partner had manipulated him into being a distraction, immediately thinking of slipping away the moment Illumi caught sight of him behind Raymond. Yet, Hisoka's thoughts then drifted to Illumi's condition earlier, and his body trembled even more intensely. Does that mean he's strong enough to pose a serious threat to Azaldik of Illumi's caliber? Hisoka's gaze locked onto Raymond, his muscles tensing with excitement. Raymond smoothly sidestepped a tree hurtling towards him, spotting Hisoka's bungee gum attached to it. But it was just a distraction as Hisoka suddenly materialized by his side and launched a punch. Raymond swiftly dodged, closing the distance between them. Hisoka's eyes widened as Raymond's fist came at him, prompting him to throw up his arm to block. Though he managed to deflect the blow, the force of it sent Hisoka crashing to the ground with a resounding thud. Grimacing, 
he quickly leaped back to his feet, brushing off the impact as if it were nothing. Ah, delightful pain! Hisoka muttered, excitement dancing in his eyes as he felt his arm numbed from the impact. This is going to be quite annoying. Meanwhile, Raymond frowned as he realized that Hisoka was much tougher than Illumi. That punch would have likely broken Illumi's arms if he had blocked it the same way. Thinking back on Hisoka's abilities from his knowledge and the information his subordinates had gathered on notable individuals, Raymond knew it would be challenging to defeat Hisoka without exposing his full strength. Hmm, I need to come up with a way to take down someone like him without revealing everything, Raymond muttered to himself, sighing. He was still cautious, knowing that other hunters from the Hunter Association were nearby. Revealing his full capabilities prematurely was not something he wanted to risk. Then, what should I do with you? Raymond's eyes gleamed as he pondered his next move, recalling the information he had received prior to the hunter exam. But then his expression darkened as he noticed a flurry of cards coated with Nan heading his way. He quickly dodged them, leaping backward to evade the attack. Ah, this is it. Such an excitement. Hisoka shouted excitedly, seizing the chance to dash towards Raymond with a crazed look in his eyes. Hisoka unleashed a powerful whirlwind kick aimed at Raymond's abdomen while Raymond countered with a swift kick of his own. A look of surprise flashed across Hisoka's eyes as he felt his bones creaking under the force of Raymond's blow. Keek. But Hisoka wasn't finished yet. The card he had launched earlier streaked through the air towards Raymond with incredible speed, blurring in its trajectory. Hisoka seized Raymond's leg, locking him in place and leaving him vulnerable to the incoming attack. Considering the card's speed and his lack of preparation, Hisoka knew that trying to catch them barehanded would come at a costly price. You've learned from your mistakes, haven't you? Raymond remarked, noting that the cards were attached to Hisoka's own body. The attack wasn't aimed at him at all but at Hisoka himself. Hmm. Suddenly, Hisoka felt a surge of alarm as Raymond's eyes glowed once more. In his perspective, a vivid crimson hue enveloped everything, reflecting the color of his gaze. In this surreal moment, time itself seemed to bow to Raymond's will, slowing down to a crawl as his thought process accelerated and heightened his perceptions. This allowed him to perceive the minutest details clearly. With hands infused with his nan, Raymond swiftly seized the incoming cards. Each one gripped firmly as a surge of nan erupted from his arms. His aura devoured Hisoka's bungee gum, allowing him to swiftly swat away the remaining cards that he couldn't catch. They sliced through the trees with precision as they veered off course. All of this unfolded within mere milliseconds as Hisoka, sensing the danger, quickly released his hold and attempted to put some distance between himself and Raymond. A shiver ran down Hisoka's spine as he found himself locked in the piercing gaze of Raymond's glowing crimson eyes. In an instant, Raymond closed the distance between them, his face looming ominously close to Hisoka's. Suddenly, Hisoka felt a searing pain as both of his arms were torn away in a blur of movement. Raymond had turned Hisoka's own card against him with shocking precision. Asterisk boom. With a forceful kick to his chest, Hisoka was sent hurtling toward the same crater he had been in moments before landing with a resounding boom. The impact created a gaping hole in the ground, the dust settling as Raymond landed on the ground with a heavy thud while Hisoka's severed arms fell limply to his sides. Ugh. Hisoka grunted in pain, blood spewing from his mouth as he assessed his now armless body. With a grimace, he tightened his muscles in an attempt to stem the bleeding. Raymond closed in on Hisoka, his movements deliberate. Placing a foot firmly on Hisoka's chest to immobilize him, Raymond held Hisoka's severed arms in one hand while idly twirling a card in the other. A crazed laugh bubbled from the clown's lips as he looked up at the mesmerizing crimson eyes that seemed to be utterly looking down on him. Were you holding back against Illumi? That's none of your business. Raymond knew Hisoka was stronger than Illumi, considering the way his strength almost rivaled his own. More importantly, Hisoka's ability to swiftly provoke Raymond into using his eyes was enough proof. Kakik. Hisoka's laughter echoed filling the air with a sense of madness. Raymond's crimson eyes shimmered as he gazed at Hisoka's disheveled form. You seem to have some plan with him. Care to share? Hisoka's smile widened as he spoke, as if his battered appearance didn't bother him. You've got a few screws loose up there, Raymond remarked, his brow furrowing as he regarded Hisoka with a mix of disdain and pity. But I won't end you here. Take it as a favor you need to pay in the future. With a swift motion, Raymond hurled one of Hisoka's arms, sending it soaring across the island. He repeated the action with Hisoka's other arm in the opposite direction. Then, with precision, Raymond swung the card in his hand, severing Hisoka's legs and leaving him helpless and incapacitated. 
I know you've put Yurnan into those limbs. Survive if you can. And when the time comes. Keek keek. Don't ask questions. Just do as you're told. Raymond tossed Hisoka's legs away in a completely different direction compared to both of Hisoka's arms. What if I refuse? Raymond's expression remained stoic, it won't change anything. I'll get what I want, with or without your help. Kakik. With that, Raymond turned and walked away, leaving behind the sound of Hisoka's maniacal laughter. Chapter 32, Claiming What's Mine That should be enough to let them know I'll come over for a visit, Raymond muttered softly. He was satisfied that he had accomplished what he came to do and completed his objectives for the time being. Despite the minor damage to his blazer, he shook his head and proceeded to take the badges on his blazer before tossing it away. Raymond. As he put the badges on his vest, he heard a cheerful and excited voice calling out to him. Raymond turned his body as he heard someone calling his name. He spotted Gon and the others making their way through the raised forest. Their footsteps echoed softly. Raymond. Are hunters usually this strong? Gon asked with a mix of curiosity and amazement at what he'd just witnessed. Well, you can say so. Raymond replied with a chuckle, noticing the speechless reactions of the others beside Gon. Gon's excitement was evident as he jumped around, asking, Really? So, can I become as strong as you? Raymond nodded with a smile, Of course, Gon. As long as you put in the work, anything is possible. Yet, beneath his encouraging words, Raymond couldn't shake the thought of Gon's father, Jing. He wondered in interest, was Jing as formidable as Netero? Meanwhile, Leorio shook his head and muttered, maybe I should consider becoming a gourmet hunter. Karapika was usually quick to respond. But he remained silent this time, lost in his own thoughts. He watched Raymond intently, his expression was a mix of emotions. Though he appeared more collected now as his scarlet eyes was nowhere to be seen, there was still a hint of turmoil in his eyes. After a pause, Karapika found his voice, trying to draw Raymond's attention. Raymond. Hmm. Are you, from the Kurta clan? I know about the tragedy that befell your clan. It's unfortunate. Raymond shook his head sympathetically. Karapika's eyes flashed with emotion as he heard about his clan, the intensity of his feelings evident in his gaze as his scarlet eyes emerged. Raymond couldn't help but admire the beauty of Karapika's eyes, understanding why they were coveted by many. I understand how you feel, but I'm not part of your clan, Raymond explained calmly. I see. Karapika's disappointment was evident as his eyes dulled in response to Raymond's revelation. Leorio glanced at the gaping hole where Hisoka had been. Is he, gone for good? That clown's like a stubborn cockroach, Raymond replied, shaking his head. He then turned to Gon, he should be your target, right? Eh? That's right, Gon responded, surprised. How did you know? You followed him this far, didn't you? Raymond shrugged. You're right. Gon nodded in agreement, realizing Raymond had a point. Well, whatever. Just grab his badge while you have the chance, Raymond advised before walking away. Take care, kids. You too, Raymond. Gon, Leorio and Karapika watched him go, slowly disappearing into the forest. Let's go for Gon's target first, Karapika suggested and everyone nodded in agreement. They cautiously made their way toward where Hisoka should have been lying. As they approached, a silence fell over the group. Hisoka's limbless form lay before them, wearing a smile as if nothing were amiss. Well, well, well. Look who it is, Hisoka greeted them with a smirk, his voice oozing with unsettling charm. Leorio felt a bead of sweat trickle down his forehead. This guy is seriously nuts, he muttered under his breath. I'll be taking your badge now, Hisoka, Gon declared, reaching for the badge on Hisoka's chest. Hisoka simply nodded in response, a hint of amusement in his eyes. Go ahead, take it. I'm not going anywhere, he replied casually. Karapika observed Hisoka's limbless form with a mix of fascination and dread. Despite his injuries, Hisoka seemed oddly composed, almost as if he were unfazed by the situation. Still, besides all of that, Karapika couldn't help but wonder how Hisoka managed to stop his bleeding. Could it be similar to Killua's muscle control? Karapika pondered silently. In another part of the forest, Raymond frowned as he realized Cypher's body and his kitchen knife were nowhere to be found. Expanding his senses, Raymond disappeared into the forest. After the battle, 
the spectators from the Hunter Association finally felt relieved that things hadn't escalated further. A man in a black suit approached a burly blonde colleague, both dressed similarly. Behind them floated some covered objects. Captain Yu, we found number 80's body, the hunter reported, showing Cypher's decapitated corpse. Yu nodded, solemnly observing the grim sight before examining the severed head, noticing the needles embedded in her forehead. Poor soul, Yu shook his head with a sigh. His deep voice sent a shiver down his subordinate's spine. Even without Raymond's action, Cypher's situation looked bleak after being struck by the deadly needles. Or, if she somehow survived the initial assault, the potent nun infused within those needles would have quickened her demise, regardless of Raymond's actions. And here's something else I found nearby, his subordinate added, presenting a kitchen knife. Strangely, it appeared spotless, showing no signs of its recent use during the battle. Hold on, return that to where you found it. But Yu's eyes widened with realization. That was number number 406's weapon. They were forbidden from taking anything belonging to participants still in the exam unless they were confirmed deceased. The subordinate's face drained of color as you let out a heavy sigh. That's why you're supposed to use the communication device to report any findings. It's there to prevent incidents like this. You scolded his subordinate. But his words seemed to fall on deaf ears as the subordinate remained pale, his attention fixated elsewhere. Yu's frown deepened. What are you? Yu's voice trailed off as he followed the subordinate's gaze, only to come face to face with Raymond, who had suddenly appeared in front of them. Kai -a, 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 a startled but unmanly scream pierced the air. The subordinate who was terrified by Raymond's sudden appearance a while ago could only stare at his captain in shock. His fear was momentarily forgotten as he witnessed the unexpected reaction from his usually manly captain. Raymond's expression turned rigid as he heard such a scream from the buff captain, who had fallen on his butt in front of him. I'll just pretend I didn't hear that, he muttered to himself. Raymond then sighed as he continued, but, I do need my knife back. The subordinate snapped back to reality but remained frozen, still shaken by what he had witnessed from Raymond earlier. Likewise, the captain felt a shiver run down his spine. However, realizing that Raymond was only here for his knife, he coughed awkwardly and turned to his men. Cough. Give him the knife, he instructed as he switched back to his deep voice trying to regain his composure. Understood, the subordinate replied, his voice trembling slightly as he handed back Raymond's knife. Thanks, Raymond's figure vanished once again. Once Raymond was gone, both the captain and the guy breathed a sigh of relief. However, they then looked at each other, feeling awkward at what had just happened. Chapter 33, Wrapping Up As Gon took Hisoka's badge, he trailed along with Karapika and Leorio into the woods. But unbeknownst to them, Someone lurked nearby, hiding behind bushes. That kid's got himself some buddies now, hey? That's gonna be a bother. Muttered the figure. The man had an afro and wore sunglasses. It was Goretta, number 384. Guess I'll just have to wait it out, he mumbled, keeping pace with the group as they moved forward. As night descended, the forest fell into a hushed tranquility. Crackle, crackle. Amidst the quiet, a crackling fire broke the silence. Surrounded by simplicity, a plain wooden table accompanied the scene. Though lacking in fancy details, it served its purpose, adding a touch of practicality to the otherwise rustic setting. Despite the remoteness of his location, Raymond seemed at ease even though he felt someone was watching him quietly. He tended to the fish he had caught earlier that day. With practiced hands, he cleaned and gutted each fish with precision, ensuring they were ready for cooking. From the depths of his vest, Raymond retrieved a small pouch containing an assortment of spices. With a knowing smile, he carefully sprinkled the spices onto the fish, each movement deliberate and calculated. But as he reached for another ingredient, he paused, a playful glint in his eye. Almost forgot the king of flavor, he murmured to himself, a chuckle escaping his lips. From the depths of his pocket, he took out the miraculous white powder he had prepared before the hunter exam. He then sprinkled the powder onto the fish, its aroma filling the air with a unique aroma. Once the fish were seasoned to perfection, Raymond arranged them by the fire, the flames crackling merrily beneath the makeshift grill. Beautiful. He watched attentively as the fish cooked, turning them occasionally to ensure they were evenly browned and tender. When he judged them ready, Raymond smiled with satisfaction. Great, can't wait to give it a taste. Carefully, he arranged a bed of leaves he had collected earlier on the table. The color contrast made it look beautiful with the golden hue of the cooked fish. 
With a smile, he placed each fish on top, their fragrant aroma mingling with the scent of the forest around him. Raymond. A voice rang out, making him to take a look. Oh. Raymond then saw Killua approaching, his mouth watering at the sight of the food. Sorry, these are all mine. You'll have to catch your own fish. I'll help you cook it, Raymond chuckled. Really? Cool. Killua's eyes sparkled with excitement as he dashed off towards the nearby river to catch his own dinner. Having observed Raymond quietly for a while, Killua noticed the badges on his vest. Now, with Raymond seemingly finished with his task, Killua couldn't resist the temptation of the delicious food laid out before him. Despite years of training to resist hunger, the memory of Raymond's cooking during the exam lingered, making Killua's mouth water uncontrollably. As Killua eagerly scampered away, Raymond shook his head with a small smile. Rising slowly from his seat, he walked over to a log he had chopped earlier, retrieving his knife to make a simple chair for the table that he made with the same technique. It might be simple, but as long as it served its purpose, Raymond was satisfied. Meanwhile, deep in the forest, Goretta lay in wait as he kept observing Gon's group as they rested beneath a big tree. Taking a deep breath, he quietly readied his blowgun. This is my chance. I'll start with the blonde, Goretta silently thought to himself lining up his shot on Karapika. Amidst the group's laughter, Goretta's gaze sharpened, his breath held as he took aim. With a surge of adrenaline, he prepared to make his move as excitement coursing through him. Goretta focused on his target, readying himself to shoot. But just as he was about to take action, confusion washed over him. His attention shifted abruptly, and he found himself staring at a headless body lying nearby. At Goretta's voice trembled with confusion. He struggled to make sense of the grisly sight. Before he could react, darkness consumed him. Goretta then collapsed with his consciousness slipping away as he realized the headless corpse was in fact his own. The mysterious attacker swiftly disappeared into the shadows, snatching Goretta's badge with him. Not my target, Illumi muttered under his breath, glancing at the badge he held in his mouth. It was Hisoka's target. Well, he should be able to manage on his own. His hands were injured after making it impossible to grasp the batch. Resorting to using his foot in the attack, Illumi was now barefoot. He had to adapt to his new limitations. Well, I've gathered enough badges to pass the exam. Time to lay low, Illumi decided, vanishing into the darkness to hide. Though he spotted the group Goretta was after, Illumi had no plans to harm them when he already had enough. The recent thrashing he took from Raymond had put him on high alert. Until he felt completely safe, Illumi knew he had to be cautious and keep a low profile, avoiding drawing unnecessary attention to himself. He acted with restraint and only moved when necessary. Illumi took great care to hide himself, sometimes trailing random participants he encountered before making his move. He encountered number 362, Ken Mai. After quietly following him, Illumi took his life and batch. Later, he encountered number 118, Sami, who had betrayed number 16, Tanpa. Both had been defeated by Karapika and Leorio and were tied up. Sami managed to free himself from the tie, leaving Tanpa behind. Unaware of the danger, he continued on, unaware that Illumi was patiently tailing him, waiting for the right moment to take his batch. By luck, Goretta happened to be nearby, and the rest was history. Meanwhile, in a huge hole yawned in the ground and surrounded by the wreckage of a burnt-out forest. Hmm? Stuck, are we? Hisoka sensed a slight resistance with his bungee gum, the elastic and rubbery aura extending from his hand seemed to have met an unexpected obstacle along the way. Chuckling to himself, he remarked, looks like I'll be staying a bit longer. Well, well. How interesting. A strange noise escaped him as he recalled the one-sided battle from earlier. Raymond showed such impressive awareness of his abilities, catching Hisoka off guard with superhuman speed and reactions. He couldn't help but be curious about Raymond's true identity. Until next time, number number 406. A sly grin crept onto Hisoka's face as his laughter ringing out into the surrounding silence. In the blink of an eye, six days had gone by, marking the end of the fourth phase as the ship reached the island. Chapter 34, Silence On these six days, Killua stuck close to Raymond. Why? Because Raymond's cooking was always top-notch. Killua couldn't resist the delicious meals he cooked up. Killua had no idea that the man in front of him had recently defeated his older brother, leaving him injured and unable to use both arms. Even if he knew about it, Killua would even be cheering for Raymond since he hated his brother. 
and more importantly, Killua couldn't help but admire Raymond's resourcefulness. With just a kitchen knife, Raymond managed to build a simple shelter from the nearby wood. Inspired by Raymond's example, Killua decided to build his own shelter under his guidance, eager to learn from his skills. During those six days, Killua gradually dropped his guard around Raymond. He found himself strangely drawn to him and even looking up to him a bit, a feeling he hadn't experienced with his siblings before. At the same time, Hanzo stumbled upon their camp, intrigued by the shelters and the tantalizing scent of food drifting through the forest. His eyes sparkled as he recognized Raymond, recalling the delicious meals he had cooked during their previous encounters. As Hanzo laid eyes on Killua, the memory of being outwitted by the boy surged back, casting a dark shadow over his face. Sensing Hanzo's annoyance, Killua hid behind Raymond with a smug grin on his face, only adding fuel to Hanzo's ire. Nevertheless, Hanzo managed to secure his target number after days of relentless searching. Setting aside his grievances, Hanzo decided to join them, eager for another taste of Raymond's culinary creations. And so, the three of them settled into a relaxed daily routine. Raymond would often keep to himself in his shelter, which puzzled both Killua and Hanzo, who found his behavior a bit odd. Yet, they then brushed it off as just another quirk of such an individual. Meanwhile, Hisoka managed to collect both of his arms and legs by the third day. Still, to pass the exam, he needed to find six targets to meet his quota. Or four if he could find his target number. However, unbeknownst to him, Ilumi had already taken his target number and disappeared along with it making it impossible for Hisoka to only get targeting four participants. However, even if he had known, Hisoka wouldn't have been bothered. With plenty of other participants still in the game, he had no shortage of potential victims to pursue. With that goal in mind, Hisoka ventured deeper into the forest. He eliminated any living creature that crossed his path to secure the six numbers required for his exam pass. Meanwhile, Ilumi maintained his caution, laying low until the exam's conclusion drew near. As for Gon and his group, they find themselves unexpectedly trapped in a cave. This was similar with the events of the original storyline as they try to get Leorio's target number from Ponzu. The fourth phase has come to an end. Please make your way back to the starting points where our ship is docked. You have one hour to return. The announcement echoed through the area. In addition, it was emphasized that exchanging badge numbers during this time was strictly forbidden, with disqualification as the consequence. Yay! It's finally time for the next phase. Killua's voice bubbled with excitement as he turned to Raymond, grabbing his hand eagerly like an enthusiastic younger brother, Come on, Raymond, let's go. Raymond was left speechless by this development as it completely him off guard. With a nod, he tucked his spices away and started making his way back. Hanzo silently followed suit, and soon the trio reached the starting point. Congratulations on making it through, Kara greeted them as they arrived. Please wait here for the others to join you. Killua couldn't hide his disappointment upon hearing they had to wait, seriously? We still have to wait? That's so annoying. After some time, Hisoka's figure was seen as he immediately looked at Raymond before chuckling as he sat down on the side of the tree. Killua, feeling bored, noticed that time was running out and only the four of them remained. He turned to Raymond with a question. Hey Raymond, do you think Gon and the others will make it? Hmm, hard to say but they should, Raymond replied. Yeah, I think so too. Leorio might struggle, but Karapika and Gon are pretty strong, Killua said, his face lighting up. Watch your mouth, you brat. Suddenly, a loud voice interrupted them from the forest. It was Leorio, clearly annoyed by Killua's words, while Gon waved happily. Karapika shook his head at the commotion and gave Raymond a nod in greeting. Ignoring Leorio's anger, Killua eagerly approached Gon, and the two friends began excitedly recounting their latest adventure to each other. Leorio's face flushed even redder with frustration as he watched them. Meanwhile, Hanzo and Hisoka observed the scene with interest. Hmm. Suddenly, Hisoka's attention shifted to the forest as he sensed someone rapidly approaching. Raymond also noticed this and turned to see Alumi arriving, his arms flailing uselessly by his side. Wah! Killua's face went pale at the sight of Alumi's torn appearance. He instinctively jumped back, seeking safety behind Raymond. How ironic, Hisoka chuckled lightly, observing Killua seeking shelter behind the very person who had harmed his own brother. Gon glanced at Killua, clearly puzzled. While Karapika and Leorio's expressions turned serious at the sight of Alumi. Peeking out from behind Raymond, Killua shouted, 
what are you doing here? Ignoring Killua's question, Ilumi fixed his gaze on Raymond before turning to Killua, who sought refuge behind Raymond. A strong sense of hostility radiated from Ilumi, causing everyone to tense up at the sight. How dare you lay a hand on my brother, Ilumi's voice rang out. It was filled with anger, completely different than his usual tone devoid of emotions. His love for Killua was undeniable, despite his twisted way of showing it. It was evident that he would do whatever it took to keep Killua safe in his own way, especially from someone as dangerous as Raymond. The whole area went into silence as everyone turned to look at Raymond in silence. Could you please don't say things like that? I might get arrested for those, Raymond felt slightly speechless at these words. The intense situation came to an abrupt halt as hunters from the association emerged from the shadows, led by Captain Yu. They encircled Illumi, putting a stop to the confrontation. This is a warning. Please refrain from any further actions, Captain Yu's deep voice echoed, causing a ripple of unease among those present. Illumi clicked his tongue in annoyance but complied, returning to his usual demeanor. Fine, he spoke, his tone went back to his usual one. Chapter 35 Revelations and Reactions As Illumi's bloodlust eased, the hunters were visibly relaxed. Their nerves were on edge, feeling the bloodlust even though they were a seasoned hunter. Ahem. Well, could you all kindly present your badges? Kara coughed, garnering everyone's attention. She meticulously checked each participant's points before allowing them to board the ship. Raymond scanned the group of successful participants and noticed the absence of Badaro and Pakal, who should have been quite capable of passing. His gaze then shifted to the number of badges in Hisoka's hands, a thoughtful expression crossing his face. So, he took them out, hey. Apart from Ponzu, the Amurai brothers, and Tanpa, the other participants either eliminated each other or fell victim to Hisoka or Illumi. After all, Hisoka required six badges, and Illumi needed three. After everyone boarded the ship, it set sail across the sea, carrying them back to the mainland. But their journey was far from over. Upon reaching land, they had to board an aircraft once more to reach the venue for the next and final phase. They were informed that they might need to spend the night on the aircraft again, as they still had a long journey ahead of them. Well, thanks for the help, Leorio said, feeling a bit embarrassed as he glanced away. He was grateful for their assistance, knowing that he would have fallen prey to bourbon snakes lurking at the cave entrance without them. Gon and Karapika returned his smile warmly. However, Gon then turned to Killua, who was with them and asked, Killua, is that really your brother? Even though Gon hadn't caught every detail from the beginning, he was pretty sure he'd witnessed Illumi fighting Raymond before Hisoka intervened. Meanwhile, Karapika and Leorio, who had been watching since the start, looked at Killua with mixed feelings. Yeah, why do you ask? Killua replied, seeming uncomfortable with the question about his brother. But they were all eager to understand why Killua was so scared of his brother that he hid behind Raymond. Did Killua realize he was seeking protection from someone who had harmed his brother? Or was he oblivious to it? Do you know who hurt your brother? Leorio asked, receiving a sharp look from Karapika. Ignoring it, Leorio persisted, driven by his curiosity. Of course not, how would I know that? Killua scratched his head in annoyance. His expression then shifted to a sarcastic smile, if I did know, I'd happily help take down that jerk. What? Seriously? All three of them were baffled by Killua's strong reaction and apparent disregard for family ties. However, seeing that Killua seemed unfazed by the revelation, Karapika sighed in relief and confirmed, it was Raymond who beat him up. Wow. Really? Are you sure? I thought he was just a slightly stronger chef, Killua exclaimed excitedly. His eyes shone with surprise as he placed a hand on Karapika's shoulder, seeking confirmation. Leorio stood speechless his mouth twitching in disbelief. After a moment, he managed to mutter, that guy might know how to cook, but he's definitely a fighter at heart. Yes, it was Raymond. Karapika nodded in agreement after a brief silence. Wow. I had no idea Raymond was powerful enough to defeat my brother. He's really something. Killua's expression brightened from sour to impressed upon learning that Raymond had defeated his brother. Karapika and Leorio shared a confused glance at Killua's unexpected reaction. They began to wonder whether Illumi was truly Killua's brother or if perhaps Raymond was the one who held that role. Gon chimed in, discussing how Raymond had helped him get Hisoka's badge. Their excitement grew as they discussed their experience in this exam with Raymond's help. In a meeting room on the other side of the ship, Bean stood before Netero, 
who sat at his desk, absent-mindedly stacking his desk items to form a pyramid out of it. However, Beans paid no mind to the chairman's peculiar behavior as he delivered his report. There are three participants in this exam who can use NAN, he began. They are number 44, Hisoka Maro. Number 301, Gitarakar, later revealed to be Alumi Zaldik, and lastly, number 406, Raymond Celestia. Both Hisoka and Alumi had fought against Raymond for an unknown reason, and he defeated both. Netero casually continued his desk fiddling as Beans pressed on. Beans recounted the clashes between Hisoka, Illumi, and Raymond throughout the exam. He described the possible reasons behind their fights, moves, and peculiarities that were potentially tied to their abilities and the outcomes of each confrontation. And lastly, there are only eight participants left. Beans continued listing the names patiently. Number 44, Hisoka. Number 99, Killua. Number 294, Hanzo. Number 301, Illumi. Number 403, Leorio. Number 404, Karapika. Number 405, Gon. Number 406, Raymond. Beans closed the report in his hand before addressing Netero. Should we stick to the plan, or wrap up the exam now? Despite the doubts about their intentions, I believe they're capable enough to join us. Hmm. Netero hummed, appearing lost in thought. With a final touch, he gently placed the last item, a pencil, on top of his desk before taking a deep breath. Slowly, he withdrew his hand to prevent the items from falling. Let's make a decision after I speak with them privately. Netero started to say, but his expression shifted suddenly. No. My pyramid. He exclaimed, clearly distressed by the mishap. The meticulously stacked pyramid of items collapsed, creating a cluttered mess on his desk. Understood. I'll schedule it immediately and notify the participants. Beans spoke as he gave the chairman a wry smile before he left the room. After Beans left, Netero's exaggeratedly disappointed expression turned into one of intrigue. Ignoring the mess on his desk, he shifted his gaze to the window, muttering, so aside from that dangerous nun, he still has some tricks up his sleeve, hey. A slight chuckle escaped Netero's lips as he thought about Raymond's peculiar nun properties. Knowing Raymond's cautious nature, Netero was sure there was more to uncover. Ho ho. His chuckle gradually turned into hearty laughter. It had been a long time since he felt such excitement. The last time someone stirred his excitement was a few years ago when he met an adventurous young man who was eager to explore every corner of the world. But that enthusiasm quickly waned when he realized the young man had no interest in fighting. However, he sensed something similar to him in Raymond's. And that was. The same obsession for martial arts and fighting. It should be enjoyable to fight him, Netero mused. Chapter 36, The Final Phase During the flight to their final destination, Netero arranged interviews with each candidate who had successfully completed the fourth phase. He asked the same question to every participant. Why did they aspire to be a hunter? And whom did they have their eyes on or wish to avoid in combat? When it was Raymond's turn, Netero leaned in with interest, so, care to share why you want to be a hunter? I want to get my hands on the ingredients provided by gourmet hunters that are available to fellow hunters so I can cook some at home, Raymond replied with a smile. Netero raised an eyebrow, though he knew Raymond could easily access those ingredients elsewhere. He still pretended to be surprised as he chuckled, well, that's quite an unexpected reason. Both of them smiled with their eyes closed. Any particular participants catching your eye? Netero asked casually, twirling his pen on a sheet of paper. I'd say number number 301. Raymond responded. Though he wasn't overly invested in anyone. Considering the fact that he had been keeping tabs on Illumi since the start, it was not exactly a lie either. Netero nodded, jotting down some notes before continuing, and who do you want to avoid? Number number 44. Raymond couldn't help but shake his head, finding that clown to be quite annoying. Knowing Hisoka could reattach his limbs with Nan, Raymond was convinced the same applied to his head. He was like a cockroach, resilient and irritating. Though, Raymond might have a way to kill such cockroaches. It was undeniable that Hisoka was quite a nuisance that seemed impossible to get rid of. Oh? And how about participants you'd like to fight with? Netero inquired. I'd take on anyone, but if it came to facing the kid, I might have to give them a bit of a handicap, Raymond replied. Netero chuckled, jotting down a few more notes before saying, Well then, I think we're done here. 
They continued chatting about trivial matters like cloud shapes and colors as they made their way out since Raymond was Netero's final interviewee for the day. Eventually, they parted ways in the aircraft corridor. After another night in the aircraft, they finally reached the final venue. Excitement and nervousness filled the air as everyone walked out of the aircraft. They then were guided by the staff to their destination. The final venue for their final exam. The venue was a spacious chamber, its walls towering high above. The floor beneath their feet was polished smooth, offering a firm footing built for a spar. The room was devoid of any furniture or obstructions, creating an open space ripe for combat. It resembled a training hall, with ample room for movement and clear sighty lines. As everyone gathered, Bean stepped forward from behind Netero. He took a moment to address the assembled participants. Firstly, congratulations to each and every one of you for making it this far, Beans began, clearing his throat before continuing. For our final exam, we have something special and that is a one-on-one -on -one combat tournament. Here's the bracket, Beans said, pointing to a large chart that a staff member brought over for everyone to see. The winner of each match will move forward to become a hunter, while the loser will get another shot in the tournament, Beans clarified, his gaze sweeping over the bracket. To win, you must make your opponent admit defeat. Beans also reminded everyone of another critical rule for the final stage. No killing allowed. Breaking this rule meant immediate disqualification, ensuring that the others passed the exam automatically. With that rule in place, it meant that only one participant would ultimately fail the exam, causing a wave of tension to sweep through the group. However, everyone was surprised to see the bracket before they all stole a glance at Raymond. Hmm. Raymond glanced at the bracket, unfazed by the attention he garnered from the others. The bracket was split into three parts. Losers from the first section would compete against the second, and then once the match concluded, he would progress to the final round against the loser from the third section. However, Raymond noticed something peculiar about the arrangement. In the first bracket, there were Hisoka, Leorio, Gon, and Alumi, but the pairings were a bit unexpected. Hisoka was set to face off against Leorio first, with the loser then going up against Gon. The loser of that match would then take on Alumi. In the second set of matches, Hanzo and Karapika were paired up initially. The one who lost this match would then go up against Killua. After identifying the losers from both the first and second sections, they would battle each other to determine the ultimate loser from these two sections. Ultimately, the defeated contender would have to face off against the loser from the third set of matches. However, on the third bracket, Raymond stood alone. He was positioned as the ultimate challenger, granting him just one opportunity to pass the exam. So, I'm basically the final boss, hey. Raymond mused to himself. A small smile then formed on his lips as he exchanged a knowing glance with Netero, who returned the gesture with a similar smile of his own. Observing their interaction, Beans couldn't help but feel a chill run down his spine. They must be related by blood, he muttered under his breath before quickly composing himself and refocusing on the participants. Without further ado, let's get started with the exam. I know everyone's itching to become a hunter. Beans exclaimed, excitement evident in his voice. He signaled for the participants to move to the sides, clearing the center for the upcoming battles. Leorio stepped onto the stage, glancing nervously at Raymond. I need to do well here, or else I'll end up facing him, he thought to himself. Despite his uncertainty about defeating Hisoka, Leorio knew he'd have more opportunities even if he lost this round. We can't afford to lose badly and end up facing Raymond, Karapika nodded in agreement. You're right. Gon nodded in agreement. Hisoka looked at Leorio with a small smile, which made Leorio nervous. What? What is this guy planning? Leorio was alarmed seeing Hisoka smiling at him. However, Hisoka then turned to look at Raymond before muttering, Should I fight him again? I probably should kakik. His smile widened as he thought of the opportunity to fight Raymond again. Chapter 37, Dumbfounded In the center of the arena, a hunter staff member wearing sunglasses stepped forward. I'm Masta, your referee for this tournament, he announced to Leorio and Hisoka. May the best fighter prevail. With a nod from Masta, they took their positions. Begin. He declared. Leorio wasted no time. Immediately launched himself at Hisoka with a swift kick. However, Hisoka evaded with ease with a smirk creeping up on his lips as he crouched low, surprising Leorio with his agility. This might sting a bit, Hisoka warned. His expression seemed gentle as he smiled with his eyes closed. 
Hisoka clasped his hands together. With a swift motion, he swung his hand sharply toward Leorio's back. Leorio's face turned ghostly pale, and he was sent flying a few steps backward from the attack, landing on the floor. Disgusted expressions filled the room as everyone glared at Hisoka. I give up on the match. Unfazed, Hisoka calmly raised his head, locking eyes with Masta. Everyone turned to Leorio in pity as they could feel second-hand pain from that attack as some unconsciously held their butt as well. Arg! My butt! He writhed in discomfort, clutching his backside. Screaming in pain before he passed out. Thankfully, before Leorio passed out, Hisoka had forfeited. Hisoka didn't seem to care as he then slowly made his way out. The staff member then took Leorio away, looking like he'd just seen a ghost. His complexion was completely white. Karapika stared at Leorio's limp body, at a loss for words. Hey! Leorio, woke up. He tried poking Leorio's face, hoping for any reaction but got nothing. He's totally zoned out, Karapika muttered, shaking his head. Before Karapika could think more about it, he was called to the arena. He glanced at Hanzo, silently acknowledging his opponent as they both nodded at each other. But then, Hanzo glanced over at Masta, realizing he was the one who'd been following him during the exam, which caught Gon off guard. Really? I had no clue. Did you, Killua? Yep, knew it all along. Wow, seriously? How'd you figure it out? Gon turned to Killua, thoroughly impressed. But Killua just shrugged as if it was no big deal. Meanwhile, Illumi watched their interaction with a cold stare as he silently thought, You're straying away, kill. Father would be disappointed. His injured hand had been tended to by the Hunter Association's medical team. Both of his hands were wrapped in thick bandages, covering them completely. It was evident that he wouldn't be able to use them for a while. With his injuries, Illumi remained barefoot. He was going to fight using his feet. Back in the arena, Karapika tightened his grip on both wooden swords, his expression tense as he eyed the blade in Hanzo's hand. He's got the advantage with that weapon. This is gonna be tough. With both fighters ready, Masta didn't hesitate. All right, fighters ready? Let the battle begin. They clashed, and Hanzo soon realized that Karapika was no pushover despite his young age. However, only after a few exchanges Hanzo immediately started to gain the upper hand in the fight. Both of them were skilled at dodging and blocking attacks as they traded blows with their weapons and occasional kicks. Unfortunately, Hanzo's strength gave him an advantage over Karapika. Slowly, Karapika found himself overwhelmed. Cuts marked his body, and his clothes were in tatters. Then, without warning, Hanzo closed the distance and delivered a powerful kick to Karapika's face. Ugh! The force of the blow knocked Karapika off balance, causing his vision to blur as he stumbled to the ground. Hanzo capitalized on the moment, positioning his blade threateningly at Karapika's neck. Just give up, kid. Karapika stayed silent, a stubborn growl escaping him, showing he wasn't ready to surrender. With the upper hand firmly in his grasp, Hanzo reluctantly began to pummel Karapika. Yet, to the shock of everyone's watching, Karapika refused to yield. He endured the relentless barrage of blows, even as they grew increasingly brutal. Hanzo's attack became almost inhuman leaving Karapika with a broken arm, but still, he stood his ground. Give it up, you're not tough enough to be a hunter. Those words hit Karapika hard, filling him with frustration. Slowly, his eyes started to glow, catching everyone's attention. At that moment, Karapika remembered why he started this journey. To get his revenge. Anger and hatred surged through him, visible in his eyes for all to see. Hanzo was surprised by the sheer intensity of Karapika's hatred his eyes widening in shock. That's some serious hatred. However, he quickly realized that Karapika's rage wasn't aimed at him, leaving him puzzled about Karapika's state of mind. Understanding that he couldn't change Karapika's determination, Hanzo raised his hand with a sigh, for fuck's sake, I'll forfeit this round. Hearing those words, Karapika's eyes widened in surprise as he looked at Hanzo. Realizing he had succeeded, Karapika finally let go of his pain, and with a sense of relief, he slowly passed out. The next match brought Hisoka and Gon to the arena. As he made his way in, Gon instinctively protected his rear, casting a wary glance at Hisoka, who offered a sly smile in return. However, after just a few brief exchanges, Hisoka forfeited once more. 
Gon scratched his head in mild confusion before stepping aside. This is getting boring, Raymond sat on the sidelines with no expression on his face. Glancing at his wristwatch, he decided that once the tournament was over, he'd need to leave early. It had been some time since Raymond received any updates from Sakujiro. I should check if they've been doing their job properly, he muttered, glancing towards the arena where Hanzo and Killua made their way in. Hanzo who had forfeited his last match, was up against Killua in this round. As the fight got underway, Hanzo was surprised by Killua's impressive fighting prowess, which exceeded Karapikas by a long shot. But Killua was in for a shock too. Hanzo proved to be no slouch, and Killua soon realized he was outmatched. Reluctantly, he forfeited the round which almost brought a smile upon Illumi's face as his eyes gleamed in a cunning light, seems like my needle is still working. As the tournament went on, Hisoka couldn't stop grinning. He knew that if he forfeited this round, he'd be one step closer to his next round of battle against Raymond. Entering the arena, he locked eyes with Illumi. With Masta's signal, they both got ready for the match as tension slowly built up as they prepared to face off. I forfeit. I. Hey. Hisoka's grin faltered as he glanced at Illumi, who had just forfeited a tad quicker than him. My apology, I think I just misheard it but did you just give up? Hisoka regained his composure, though confusion lingered in his expression as he questioned Illumi, who simply nodded in response. The color drained from Hisoka's face as his expression seemed to turn speechless as they exchanged awkward glances. Chapter 38, Taking Action As Killua prepared to confront his brother, a sense of tension gripped him, causing his muscles to tense up. Damn it, he muttered quietly as he walked into the arena, feeling a bit uneasy. If he had known he'd be facing Illumi, he might have put in more effort against Hanzo earlier. Meanwhile, on the sidelines, Hisoka's mood shifted dramatically. He lost interest in the proceedings and slowly left the arena, leaning against the wall with a downcast expression. Making fun of himself just like a clown does, Raymond remarked under his breath. He sensed Hisoka stealing a few glances his way, causing Raymond's lips to twitch speechlessly. Observing from the sidelines, Netero also took notice of their interaction before shifting his attention back to the arena. Killua had already made up his mind to surrender as soon as the battle began. However, he knew facing Raymond would be pointless since Raymond could easily outmatch Illumi. At least he's not giving me the creeps, Killua muttered to himself. He then looked at Illumi with a mix of fear, anger, and a hint of disgust. This prompted Illumi to frown as he sensed other emotions besides fear in his brother. Killua couldn't figure out what was going through Illumi's head as he glanced at Illumi's useless arms. Should I give it a shot? Considering the possibility, Killua's determined gaze slowly cleared, his eyes shining with resolve. Why would you dare to show such determination against a stronger opponent, Kill? Illumi's disappointment was evident as he observed the scene. I'm disappointed. Illumi's voice was flat. He shook his head and continued, I heard about you cut mom and Miluki to escape. You made mom cry. Hanzo nodded, chiming in nonchalantly, well, any mom would cry if her son did something like that. Crying tears of joy. However, Illumi's next words left Hanzo speechless. Raymond chuckled softly, convinced that every member of the Zaldik family must be a bit off. As he watched their exchange continue, he couldn't help but notice that Illumi seemed like a total killing machine from the get-go. Illumi's eyes were as lifeless as a dead fish. Then, he shifted his gaze to Killua and shook his head. But those eyes don't look like an assassin's. Killua's eyes resembled Gon's bright and filled with curiosity about the world, just like any kid his age. Illumi slowly described to Killua how he should be, just like how their father had raised him. He stressed the need for Killua to be a dedicated assassin, showing no emotions and only concentrating on the job at hand. Eliminating the targets assigned to him. In Illumi's view, this made the ultimate killing machine. Being a hunter isn't for you, kill. Hey. You don't know anything about Killua. A sharp shout broke Illumi's monologue, causing everyone to turn and see Gon. His face was flushed with anger. Gon. Killua stared at Gon in astonishment. Turning to Gon, Illumi's expression remained emotionless as he asked, And who are you? I'm Killua's friend. You are not worthy to be his brother. Gon's small frame nearly reached the arena, stopped only by the staff holding him back. He declared, Killua's coming with me to see the world. Illumi's expression faltered at Gon's words, noticing the strong emotions they stirred in Killua. Killua took a deep breath as he quickly regained his composure once again. So, this kid is the reason you're different now, 
Hoi. Ilumi's face returned to its usual emotionless demeanor, while Kilua's eyes widened in shock. Turning to Gon, Kilua shouted, Gon, get out of here. But Kilua was too late. In a flash, Ilumi vanished and reappeared right in front of Gon, who was left in a state of confusion. What? Gon could only watch as a foot neared his neck. Veins bulged from it, and the nails looked as sharp as knives just like Killua's hand when he killed the prisoner. Am I gonna die? Just as Gon felt like his life was on the line, a figure suddenly appeared in front of him. There was a loud clash as someone stopped Ilumi's attack with their hand. The impact created a booming sound that sent shockwaves, knocking Gon and everyone else nearby to the side. Gon struggled to get back on his feet before stumbling on the ground. On the side, Hisoka and the others managed to regain their balance easily. Oh ho ho, let's not go around attacking fellow participants during the exam, or we might have to disqualify you. Netero's cheerful voice rang out as things began to calm down. His figure came into view, effortlessly halting Illumi's attack with just a hand, firmly grasping Illumi's ankle. Hmm, that would be quite troublesome if I were to fail. Oh ho ho, I have faith you won't repeat this mistake. Observing that Illumi had no intention of continuing, Netero released his grip, allowing Illumi to step back slowly. Raymond glanced at Netero with indifference, but his eyes narrowed at how easily Netero thwarted Illumi's assault. It was obvious to Raymond that Illumi had been genuinely trying to kill Gon just moments ago. And yet that old man stopped it so effortlessly, Raymond thought to himself. Raymond was not one to fight in such a manner. He believed dodging was usually the better option over directly blocking an attack. Only when absolutely necessary would he resort to completely blocking an attack. With a rough estimate of Illumi's strength, Raymond realized he wouldn't be able to stop an attack like that without potentially breaking Illumi's feet. As expected of the chairman of the Hunter Association, I suppose. Raymond smiled. He was feeling satisfied with the result of his little stroll on the Hunter exam. Not only had he gained an approximate understanding of Netero's strength, but he also gleaned insights into Netero's intentions and views on the Celestia Consortium through their subtle interactions. Gone. You all right? Yeah, I'm good. Killua's worried tone echoed as he assisted Gone in standing up. Illumi, on his way back to the arena, abruptly glanced back at the pair upon hearing their exchange. Ahem. But before anything more could happen, Netero cleared his throat. This managed to stop Illumi from doing anything reckless as he swiftly redirected his attention forward and continued walking to the arena. Chapter 39, The End of the Final Phase As they returned to the arena, Killua's eyes gleamed with newfound determination, ready to give it his all this time. Illumi remained silent, his expression unreadable, as he subtly activated the needle he had implanted in Killua's head. With Master's declaration, the battle commenced. You can't fight, kill. You need to flee. I'm much more powerful than you, even without my arms. As Killua prepared to act, these words seemed to blur his vision, casting a shadow of darkness and purple hues over his surroundings. His consciousness began to fade, his senses numbing as if he were losing grip on reality. He must have done something to Killua. Gon's eyes widened in shock as he watched Killua's vibrant eyes gradually lose their sparkle, turning dull and lifeless, mirroring his brother's gaze. Raymond watched with interest as he observed Illumi using his nan to manipulate Killua's mind. Hmm, so he has different kinds of needles. During their fight in the fourth phase, Illumi used his regular needles to control Cyper's mind, forcing her to attack him. The one he used for Cyper was definitely life-threatening for her. However, he couldn't see any visible needles on Killua, indicating that the ones used on him were much smaller. And the fact that he used them on his own brother. Raymond concluded that the needles in Killua were probably not lethal, as Illumi wouldn't want to kill his beloved little brother. Seeing that his manipulation worked, Illumi nonchalantly nodded as Killua slowly raised his hand and forfeited. Hey! Hanzo observed with sharp eyes as an unexpected turn of events unfolded. He noticed Killua was about to give it a try considering the sharpness in his eyes, yet he suddenly gave up. Gon was also surprised by this sudden change. He began to approach Killua, but Netero intervened. Isn't the fight over? I need to speak with him, Gon objected, but Netero just shook his head and signaled Masta to continue with the final round. Raymond casually strolled over, coming to a halt in front of Killua, who suddenly emanated a strong bloodlust. Oh. His attention shifted to Illumi, whose expression remained devoid of emotion which made him slightly chuckle. What a coward. Raymond grasped the situation. Illumi was using Killua to try and fight him, 
understanding that he wouldn't kill Kilua due to the rules in place. Not only that, but it seems like he was trying to figure something out. Raymond murmured to himself, realizing that Illumi must have noticed Raymond holding back during their previous fight. I don't expect you to respond to anything I say, but I'll give you a handicap. Raymond began to speak, catching Netero's interest. Remembering how Netero had faced both Gon and Killua with just one hand in the original canon, Raymond smirked. He slowly raised a finger on his right hand and continued, I'll only use one finger. What? That's risky. Hanzo's voice echoed loudly, his concern evident. Having fought Killua before, and only knowing Raymond as a cook, he couldn't comprehend how Raymond would attempt such a feat. Hisoka's smile widened slightly in anticipation of the entertainment that would follow, while Gon stood silently with a serious expression on his face. Oh ho ho ho. Netero chuckled lightly, noticing Raymond casting a glance his way as if affirming that he was a man of his word. Meanwhile, Illumi's eyes briefly flashed with a frown. He was clearly caught off guard by Raymond's unexpected handicap. I want to see his intention to my family, yet he only uses a finger, hey. This left him even more puzzled silently wondering. Is his problem really just with me? If that's true, then good. Once I understand who you are. Illumi gaze hardened with a hint of bloodlust as he observed the situation, Masta signaling for both fighters to prepare as he shouted, Begin. Killua swiftly disappeared from view, reappearing right next to Raymond in the blink of an eye. He launched a spinning kick towards the back of Raymond's head, but Raymond simply leaned back, avoiding the attack effortlessly. Not missing a beat. Killua adjusted his position mid-air, twisting his body to the side. His arm tensed as veins bulged beneath his skin, and his nails elongated into sharp points, resembling knives. With precision, he slashed his arm towards Raymond's exposed side, aiming for a decisive strike. Raymond chuckled lightly at Killua's attack, then swiftly closed the distance between them instead of just dodging. Killua flinched in surprise as Raymond appeared right in front of him, moving so quickly it caught him off guard. This is going to sting. Before Killua could react, Raymond extended his hand and flicked Killua's forehead with unexpected force. Despite its seemingly gentle nature, the flick packed a punch, sending Killua flying backward. With a loud crash, Killua slammed into the nearby wall, creating a noticeable dent. Dust and debris filled the air as Killua slumped to the ground, momentarily stunned by the impact. Ugh! Killua's body slumped to the ground, his movements unsteady as he groaned in discomfort. He shook his head vigorously his entire body aching with pain. What's going on? But the worst of it all was the searing agony in his head. It felt like his skull was being split apart, the pain so intense that he almost wished he could sever his head to make it stop. Meanwhile, Hanzo stood in disbelief, his eyes wide at the sight unfolding before him. Isn't he just a cook? Just a cook? Hisoka shook his head slightly, a small chuckle escaping his lips at Hanzo's reaction, finding it amusing. Oh ho 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 that's one way to wake a kid up. Meanwhile, Netero rubbed his beard thoughtfully, recognizing that the flick had surprisingly helped Killua snap out of his brother's influence. Raymond slowly approached Killua, who remained on the ground. As Killua noticed Raymond approaching, he lifted his gaze, trying to make sense of the situation despite feeling disoriented. It all felt like a strange blur, but he gradually pieced things together. He realized that he truly tried his best to kill the person standing before him. W.Y. Killua's voice quivered as he voiced the question lingering in his mind, You, could have killed me, couldn't you? Raymond didn't reply immediately to Killua's question. Instead, he extended a finger to offer assistance, causing Killua to flinch slightly, recalling the earlier flick to his forehead. Despite his hesitation, Killua found himself accepting Raymond's help, slowly rising to his feet. I only kill those who deserve it. Raymond said softly, his words causing Killua's eyes to widen in shock. Though there were some exceptions, Raymond would only resort to violence against those who wished to harm him and his family, as well as those who wished to harm his interests. These words stirred something deep within Killua, leaving him feeling shaken to his core. It was like a flood of emotions surged through him, overwhelming his senses. Do you still want to go on? I'll stick to using just one finger. Killua avoided Raymond's gaze, feeling a pang of shame. I forfeit this round, too, he admitted quietly. Chapter 40, Coming Home After Killua forfeited the tournament, this brought it to an end as the mood shifted, leaving behind a mix of relief and disappointment. Gon wanted to comfort his friend. He moved forward, 
trying to approach Killua but was stopped by Netero. Before Gon was about to ask why, Ilumi appeared beside Killua which made him to almost jump right at him. Seeing Ilumi just whisper something in Killua's ears, Gon calmed himself down. However, Whatever Illumi had said seemed to have visibly affected Killua before he disappeared from sight, leaving behind a sense of curiosity and concern in Gon. Meanwhile, Raymond approached Netero as he slowly opened up his mouth. Chairman, could you please send my license to my office? I'll give you an address. I've been away for weeks, and I'm eager to check on my company, he asked politely. That wouldn't be posse. Beans hesitated to accept Raymond's excuse, but Netero intervened swiftly. Oh ho ho ho, please, I wouldn't dare delay someone as esteemed as you, he interjected with his trademark joviality. Thank you for your understanding. Raymond expressed gratitude to the chairman before bidding farewell to Gon and his companions. Exiting the building, he found a car waiting for him outside. Looks like he's on his own, Raymond said with a chuckle. Raymond knew that if there was only one car, it meant his trusted subordinate was coming to fetch him alone. As expected. A middle-aged man with a stern expression approached Raymond and bowed respectfully. Welcome back, Master. Good to see you again, Sakujiro, Raymond replied with a smile tugged on his lips. Sakujiro remained silent as he opened the passenger door, allowing Raymond to step inside and take a comfortable seat. Hmm. As Sakujiro was about to return to the driver's seat, he noticed Satos looking his way and nodded in acknowledgement. Satos returned the nod before resuming his duties and the car slowly pulled away. Observing the vehicle as it gradually disappeared from view, Satos' expression turned serious. What's up, Satos? Beans asked, noticing Satos lost in thought. That guy who drives for Raymond Celestia. He's from Meteor City, the one who disappeared years ago, Satos shook his head, looking serious as he revealed. Is he that guy behind that accident years ago? Beans exclaimed, his eyes widening. Satos nodded solemnly, Yes, that's him. Hand me the report, Raymond spoke while gazing out the window as they drove into the city. Understood. Sakujiro complied, pressing a button next to his seat. A drawer slid open on the passenger side, and Raymond casually retrieved the files, flipping through them as they continued their journey. Hmm? So we've found a replacement for Albert already. How capable is he? Well, he might not match up to Albert in terms of being a decoy but he's the best option we have for now, Sakujiro explained. I see, Raymond acknowledged with a nod. We may not have Albert anymore, but if this replacement is our best bet, then we'll make it work. Sakujiro nodded in agreement. They had leaned heavily on Albert's authority to boost their influence in your new city. Losing him was quite a hassle, given how many of these Mafia members saw him as their primary leader, oblivious to the real power behind him. From the outset, Albert had acted as a facade. Raymond had no intention of aligning himself with criminals, particularly those who could damage his company's reputation if their collaborations were revealed. Moreover, he harbored a personal disdain for these criminals. If given the chance, he would have taken it upon himself to reform them from the ground up. As for his pursuit of Albert's killer, it was merely his way of saying hello. That's why he never intended to kill Illumi in the first place. Even though Illumi tried to take his life, Raymond just let it slide since he attacked first. He knew better that it was not something that should be done casually to target a member of the Zaldik family. Raymond understood the consequences of such actions, as the Zaldiks wouldn't hesitate to seek vengeance. As for Illumi's vengeful nature, Raymond just considered it to be adorable. Should I get the aircraft ready? Sakujiro inquired while observing Raymond's calm expression as he tapped his fingers on the armrest. Observing Raymond's behavior over time, Sakujiro could tell that his master was contemplating something. No hurry. Let's visit them later. I think I'll head home first, Raymond replied, a slight smile forming on his face. Sakujiro's smile mirrored Raymond's, reassured that all was going according to plan. Meanwhile, Raymond watched the scenery pass by through the window, his crimson eyes gleaming with coldness, let's see if we talk the same language, Zaldik. If not, then. He'd have to play his hand sooner than expected. With such resolve revolving in his heart, the car navigated its way through the bustling city streets, gradually fading into the flow of busy traffic. After the tournament reached its end, and the hunter exam officially concluded, all the successful participants gathered for a debriefing on the perks and responsibilities that came with being a hunter. Upon learning that Killua had returned home and might be facing consequences for his escape, Gon felt compelled to visit as he decided to go to Killua's house. 
Karapika and Leorio, worried about Gon, decided to join him on this unexpected trip. Hisoka grew increasingly bored, his mind wandering back to Raymond's words about the price he had to pay for his life. A favor, hey? I'm looking forward to it. The prospect of the unknown stirred excitement within him, evident in the eager lick of his lips. Or. Should I go pay him a visit? Driven by curiosity, Hisoka attempted to scour the Hunter Association's database for details on Raymond. Restricted access. Hisoka's face betrayed no emotion as he faced the obstacle of the restricted section. Despite his initial disappointment, his curiosity surged even more. Raymond's details were locked away, accessible only to the elite members of the association. This revelation piqued Hisoka's interest, suggesting that Raymond's identity was quite unique even within the Hunter Association. Kakik. But Hisoka brushed off the restriction, his focus unwavering on the thrilling prospect of a life or death battle. With no leads on Raymond, Hisoka knew tracking him down for another thrilling battle would be near impossible for him. Yet, he couldn't let his craving for excitement go unquenched. His eyes twinkled with mischief as a cunning plan formed in his mind. Kakik, why not cultivate the seed to hasten its growth? With his strategy set, Hisoka eagerly anticipated his next move. Chapter 41, Looming Shadows Several weeks had passed since the conclusion of the hunter exam. Gon and his companions set out on a journey to visit Killua in the Republic of Paidokia. Meanwhile, in an unfamiliar setting filled with people dressed in suits hurrying down the corridor, Beans guided a short, elderly man with grey-white hair and a long moustache. They walked until they reached a door, where Beans knocked twice. Come in. A cheerful voice answered from inside. Beans quietly swung the door open, gesturing for the elderly man to enter ahead. Please, elder, he courteously invited. The short old man chuckled as he entered, observing Beans with a nod of approval. You have a polite one here, chairman, he remarked, his hands clasped behind his back. Oh ho ho ho. Netero laughed jovially at the compliment. He's certainly top-notch in manners, he agreed, turning to face his guest with a warm smile. Are you in a rush, Zeno? All right, let's cut to the chase. I'm not keen on idle chatter, especially at my age. I prefer the comfort of my home. The elderly man, now identified as Zeno Zaldik, said with a sigh. His tone was firm as he addressed Netero. Netero knew Zeno just completed a commission, but he didn't say anything as he gestured for Beans to leave them on their own. Beans nodded in understanding before stepping back and closing the door behind him, leaving the two men alone for their discussion. Standing outside, he patiently awaited their discussion, ready to assist if needed. Hmm, let's play one game of shogi. Netero pondered for a moment before changing his mind, no, wait. Let's play chess instead. With a swift movement, Netero retrieved a chessboard from his desk and set it over on the table. Take a seat. Taking a comfortable seat on the nearby sofa, he invited Zeno to join him. Did you really bring me here just for a game of chess? Zeno questioned, shaking his head as he took a seat across from Netero. Oh ho ho ho. Netero chuckled in response, his eyes gleaming with mischief. Understanding that he wouldn't receive a direct answer, Zeno sighed and decided to humor the chairman of the Hunter Association. They engaged in a game of chess, with Netero occasionally stroking his beard in thought. After a while, the game concluded. Zeno's expression soured slightly as he conceded the first game. Well, since we've started, why not make it a best of three? Netero chuckled heartily in agreement, of course, let's go for another round. The two engaged in a second game. But once again, Netero emerged victorious, much to Zeno's mild frustration. Hmm. Netero then fell into a thoughtful silence as Zeno just slightly clicked his tongue, come on, spill it. Why did you ask me to come here? Netero chuckled softly, oh ho ho ho, I just wanted to have a friendly game. You don't expect me to believe that, do you? I just wanted to test if I can still outplay you. Sigh. I see. Well. You've always been the better player, Zeno frowned. He felt slightly displeased. But. I just lost a game a few weeks ago. Zeno's eyebrows shot up in surprise, a sly old man like you lose? Has that kid returned from the other side? No, it's not Jing. It's someone else. Netero shook his head, recalling that Jing was still somewhere exploring the world. And he was referring to Raymond. Although he did make some clumsy mistakes. It was deliberate, 
as he noticed that Raymond's chess moves were so flawless that they were almost intimidating. So, he purposely let himself lose. Oh! Zeno's surprise deepened, his earlier displeasure replaced with genuine curiosity about the young man who was able to outplay Netero. Who could it be? Oh ho ho ho! Netero paused briefly in response to the question before breaking into laughter once more. Regaining his usual jovial demeanor, he spoke with a chuckle, there's some interesting activity in your home country. You might have the chance to encounter him there. Hmm. Zeno frowned, understanding that Netero wouldn't joke about such matters. If it was deemed interesting by the old man, it meant there was real power behind it. Then, that young man was behind the movement. Oh ho ho ho, who knows? I see. Deep in thought, Zeno turned to Netero and asked with a serious tone, is he strong? Netero didn't respond, just smirking in a way that sent a chill down Zeno's spine. Hm all right. Observing Netero's demeanor, it appeared that even though the young man in question was formidable, Zeno could tell that Netero was confident in his ability to prevail should a clash arise. Shaking his head slightly, Zeno rose from his seat and made his way to the door. If there's nothing more, I'll take my leave. I look forward to meeting this young man who bested you in chess. It should be interesting. Oh ho ho, it's great to see you're still as healthy, Zeno. Netero chuckled warmly, but Zeno didn't respond, exiting the room. As he left, Netero's jovial expression faded, replaced by a serious expression as his eyes gleamed. Despite their connections, they struggled to gather intel on the situation in the Republic of Paidokia. Fortunately, a higher-ranking association member in the Republic sensed some movement from Celestial Force that raised concerns. Netero sighed, reflecting on Raymond's character and methods. He knew Raymond was a man of principle. Let's hope it's nothing serious, Netero muttered quietly to himself. In the bustling city of Paidokia, a tall building bearing the Celestial Force logo stood prominently. A line of cars pulled up in front of it, each gleaming in the sunlight. Sakujiro moved to open the door for Raymond but Raymond beat him to it with a casual gesture. No need, I've got it, he said with a smile. Of course, Sakujiro replied respectfully, bowing slightly. He then led Raymond toward the building entrance. As Raymond walked through the building, employees respectfully stepped aside, nodding in acknowledgement. Raymond returned their nods with a casual wave while ignoring their gaze on his head as an adorable giggles were heard across the corridor. Baba! Ignoring the playful babbling, Raymond continued on his way heading towards a large meeting room. Sakujiro held the door open for him, ushering him inside with a respectful gesture. The room was filled with anticipation as Raymond entered, prompting everyone to rise from their seats and bow respectfully. Taking his place at the head of the table, Raymond surveyed the room. Rows of chairs stretched out before him, occupied by lower level and key executives. As Raymond settled into his seat, the attention of everyone in the room was drawn to a baby girl clinging to Raymond's head, her tiny hands tangled in his hair as she giggled playfully. Ray Ray. She adorably giggled while calling his name which prompted the room to fall into silence. Let's ignore my niece and focus on the matter at hand, Raymond said calmly. He gently placed his niece on the desk before him while a man wearing thick glasses in a black suit entered the room. With a wave of his hand, a barrier of an energy formed around the baby, creating a protective cocoon to shield her from the distractions of the upcoming meeting. Chapter 42, Visiting the Zaldik. Ava, honey, Uncle Ray has to go to work, Tatiana said, mixing concern with a hint of amusement. The baby was Luke's daughter with Tatiana. Raymond named her Ava a year ago. Ava's just playing around, don't worry. Raymond said with a smile as Ava tugged at his hair, giggling like there was no tomorrow. But Tatiana wasn't convinced, gently coaxing Ava to let go of Raymond's head as she squirmed in her little game. Baba. Ava's giggles filled the room as she continued playing with Raymond's hair. Despite Tatiana's gentle prodding, Ava held on tight to Raymond, determined to continue her playful antics. Ava, sweetheart, be a good girl and loosen your grip on uncle. But Ava remained unfazed by the plea, tightly holding on to Raymond's face. Raymond, in turn, adjusted her position so he could still see despite the face hug. Erg. My little angel. Why are you ditching me for another guy already? Luke's tone carried a despair over his daughter's fascination. A shadow crossed his face as he observed Ava joyfully perched on Raymond's face, seemingly having the time of her life. Though. In his mind, I'm so jealous. Raymond, you fucking bastard. But it wasn't just Luke who harbored a twinge of jealousy towards Raymond. 
Tatiana also was truly jealous. Especially since the words she had been eagerly anticipating coming out of her daughter's mouth weren't hers or Luke's. But. Ray Ray. Ava's giggles erupted as Raymond extended his finger for her amusement, and she happily played along. Those two syllables hung in the air, causing Tatiana to stiffen and shoot Raymond a death stare. I didn't do anything, though. This left Raymond feeling quite speechless since he hadn't done anything wrong at all. Tatiana approached them with a sigh, gently wrapping her hand around her daughter. But Ava seemed to stiffen, holding onto Raymond's head even tighter as tears welled up in her innocent eyes. Baba. Ava, sweetheart, Uncle Raymond has to go to an important meeting. Ava didn't seem to pay attention to her mother's words, instead gazing at Raymond with teary eyes, tugging at his heartstrings. Raymond sighed feeling a pang of discomfort as he reached out to comfort Ava, who struggled in his grasp, lamenting, Ray Ray. Baba. Don't you worry, little one, I won't give you away. Baba. Ava blinked her eyes adorably. Those two innocent orbs of hers were oozing with irresistible cuteness that could melt even the toughest hearts in the room. I promise. Raymond replied with a warm smile, his eyes twinkling with affection. As Ava released her tight grip on Raymond's face, he gently lifted her into his arms, meeting her gaze with a playful smile. Ready for more fun, Ava? Baba. Her enthusiastic nod and twinkling eyes showed her excitement. Want to be the boss for a day, Ava? Baba. Raymond's chuckle was met with Ava's contagious giggle, her agreement evident as she raised her head with a seemingly determined gaze in her eyes. Tatiana and Luke stood nearby, their faces briefly cast in shadows as they watched the adorable exchange with a slight depression in their heart. Our daughter, Luke muttered with blank eyes. Tatiana nodded as she sighed, she doesn't want us anymore. Let's not make a big fuss. But she's coming with me, Raymond said with a smile. Baba. Ava chimed in, clearly in agreement, as she gazed at Tatiana and Luke. Are you sure it's okay? Luke asked, rubbing his temples wearily. Ava turned to Raymond, her innocent eyes blinking with a question as she opened her tiny mouth, Baba. You're quite the little thinker, aren't you? Raymond chuckled, charmed by Ava's adorable little actions. He extended his finger for her to play with, filling the room with giggles. Tatiana sighed, watching the scene with a small smile on her lips. But her smile vanished as she recalled Ava's first words and a chill ran down Raymond's spine. And so, amidst the serious gathering of celestial forces higher UPS, a baby unexpectedly joined the meeting. All eyes turned to Raymond whose typically stern and calculating expression had softened into one of warmth. He sat at his desk, allowing the baby to play with his hand, filling the room with adorable giggles. Sin. Raymond glanced over at the man in the black suit with thick glasses, gesturing discreetly for him to muffle Ava's laughter so it wouldn't distract everyone. Is he really our boss? Keep me out of this. I don't want to end up on the wrong side of things. But. Zip it. Whispers filled the room as they all stared at Raymond, disbelief written on their faces. Sakujiro remained stoic, not showing much interest as he briefed on their progress. Raymond paid attention, nodding along and asking for more important details before giving out instructions. Seemingly grown tired of playing, Ava started to feel sleepy. Seeing this, Raymond signaled to Sin to lift the seal. He then scooped Ava into his arms, her tiny hand brushing against his face before she drifted off to sleep. All right that's a wrap. If there's nothing more, you can all head out. After an hour-long meeting, Raymond brought it to an end, and people started to leave gradually. Luke and Tatiana entered the room once everyone had left. Raymond stood up and carefully handed Ava over to her mother. Taking a seat in the corner, Tatiana left the men to their business as she smiled warmly at her daughter. Sakujiro stepped aside, motioning for Sin to leave the room. With a respectful bow, Sin left, closing the door behind him. New guy. Luke inquired, to which Sakujiro shook his head, no, he's an old hand. Just got transferred here on the master's orders. Luke's curiosity sparked as he turned to Raymond with a playful grin on his face, what's the game plan, Ray Ray? I'll cut off your beard if you call me that one more time, Raymond sighed as Luke's expression stiffened in response. That nickname was reserved solely for Ava. Raymond knew that Luke had been nurturing his beard for a few years, thinking it added a cool factor. So, his threat to cut it off was way more terrifying than one might expect. Ignoring Luke's expression, Raymond shifted his attention to Sakujiro. How's he doing? Hmm. Sakujiro furrowed his brow, 
taking a moment to recall the reports. Sin should be able to seal off around 50 meters in radius. That won't cut it. I need him to double that in a month. I'll step up his training then, Sakujiro answered. Raymond nodded, turning to Luke, how about my request? You're free to board the aircraft any time today, but... Luke's expression turned concerned as he asked, are you really sure about visiting them in person? You know we can always send a representative. Raymond chuckled, shaking his head, don't worry, even if the worst happens, I'll make it out alive. Plus, Sakujiro is coming with me. I'll be in your care, Master, Sakujiro added with a respectful nod and a hint of a smile. Hearing this, Luke just shook his head tiredly, scratching his head slightly, let's hope the Zaldik family knows how to be civilized. But are you sure you've told them of your arrival in advance? Raymond smirked in response. Seeing Raymond's iconic smirk, Luke couldn't help but feel a twitch in his lips. He felt quite speechless knowing that this guy was scheming something. Chapter 43, Unexpected Guests Raymond had arrived in a small town beneath the towering Kukuru Mountain earlier this morning. Seated comfortably in the passenger seat, he observed the passing scenery through the car window while Sakujiro navigated the vehicle along the road toward the Zaldik estate. Hmm. Raymond furrowed his brows in thought, exhaling softly as he shook his head. Noticing Raymond's reaction, Sakujiro felt a bead of sweat forming on his brow, realizing that Raymond had swiftly noticed something unusual. Meanwhile, Gon, Karapika, and Leorio had finished their training and stood in front of the testing gate of the Zaldik estate. Leorio removed his heavy vest, letting it drop to the ground with a thud. Determined to see Killua, Gon declared their mission. Let's go meet Killua. The trio approached the testing gate, ready to open it. Karapika had healed his arm during their training and was prepared to assist in the effort. However, the noise of a car approaching disrupted their action. Everyone turned their heads towards the road, where they saw a car slowly pulling up beside the guard post. Hmm. The gatekeeper, Zebro, blinked in surprise. He hadn't been informed of any visitors arriving today. With a puzzled expression, he began to walk towards the car. Raymond. Just as Gon was about to refocus on the testing gate, his eyes widened, along with everyone else's, as they saw the person stepping out of the vehicle. Raymond. They called out and immediately made their way toward him, curious about his unexpected presence in such a place. Zebro was puzzled by their reaction to the man's arrival as he scratched his head and wondered, is he also a friend of the young master? Despite his uncertainty, Zebro sensed Raymond's imposing presence and cautiously approached him. Raymond raised an eyebrow as Gon and the others approached. Oh, are you kids here to see Killua? Raymond asked casually, with Sakujiro by his side like a faithful companion. Yep. We're here to bring him back. Gon declared, his eyes shining with resolve. Karapika chimed in with a smile, curious about why Raymond was here. And what brings you here, Raymond? Leorio eyed Raymond warily, remembering the tension between him and Killua's brother, and pondered the same question. Good afternoon, welcome to the Zaldik family estate, Zebro greeted with a professional smile, capturing everyone's attention. Please forgive my ignorance, but may I inquire as to the nature of your visit today? Raymond chuckled, noting the curious gazes directed at him. His face crept up with a smirk as he calmly declared, I'm here to collect Illumi's left hand. Pardon. Zebro blinked in confusion, his expression mirroring the disbelief felt by the others who fell into silence. As I expected, this guy still has a problem with Killua's brother, Leorio muttered, feeling sweat rolling down his back after hearing Raymond's intention. And the fact that Raymond had come directly to their estate was also something else as Leorio felt slightly amazed and speechless. Gon and Karapika exchanged wry smiles, sensing a storm was brewing. Ignoring their reactions, Raymond chuckled and made his way toward the testing gate. The others were unable to resist and decided to follow. So, you gotta open it up to get in, right? You seem to be quite familiar with us. Yes, you should be coming in through this gate, Zebro answered. Sakujiro stepped up, bowing, allow me to open it up for you, master. All right, I'll leave it up to you, Sakujiro. Raymond nodded as Gon and the rest immediately examined Sakujiro's frame, which was not particularly muscular. Raymond, Grandpa Zebro mentioned that the first gate weighs two tons, and it gets heavier up to 256 tons at the seventh gate, Gon shared with him. Karapika nodded in agreement, adding, we've been training here for two weeks, and today was the day we planned to open it. 
Do you think your subordinate is strong enough for it? Will he be able to open it, though? Leorio was also skeptical that whoever this guy was beside Raymond would be able to open the gate. Well, let's see. Raymond simply smiled in response to their doubts, a confident glint in his eye. He watched as Secujiro leisurely approached the gate, not even bothering to remove his blazer. With a calm demeanor, Secujiro placed his hand on the testing gate. As he made contact, he could feel the weight pressing against his palm. His eyes sharpened, his body tensed, and his muscles slowly tightened, veins nearly bulging from every corner of his body. His frame might not be muscular. Raymond slowly thought as he looked at Sakujiro's back. But his raw strength is above mine. Raymond chuckled to himself as he watched Sakujiro, who let out a determined hiss as he gathered his strength and pushed against the gate. Gon and the others were initially surprised as Sakujiro managed to open the first gate. Whoa. He actually opened it up. Wait, it's not over yet. Their surprise turned to amazement as each subsequent gate also swung open. However. Their amazement turned to horror as the gates continued to part one after another until even the seventh and final gate gave way with a resounding boom reverberating throughout the mountain. Leorio could only look on with his mouth agape. In a dimly lit room on the other side of the mountain, the walls were adorned with human skulls and bones. A man with long white hair sat on a soft cushion on the floor, accompanied by a large hound by his side. Facing him was a short, elderly man with a long mustache. All right, I'm heading to see my grandson. Anything you want to add, Silva. Please let him know I'd like to see him, father. ALR. But before Zeno could finish, a sudden boom echoed through the estate, causing them to snap their attention toward the source of the disturbance. Hurried steps echoed through the corridor, and the room's door swung open hastily. A sweating servant rushed in, exclaiming, Patriarch. Someone went wild and opened all the testing gates. Breathing heavily, the servant moved to the side and pressed a few buttons. The ceiling slowly opened, and a camera descended, revealing multiple screens displaying multiple angles throughout the Kukuru Mountain, including the testing gate, which was now wide open. Silva's expression shifted to a frown as he rose from his seat, his gaze fixed on the faces displayed on the screen. Do you recognize them? Zeno inquired. Silva nodded, his tone serious, I've met the grey-haired man in the black suit before. He's formidable, none of our servants can match him. Hmm? You think they're here to cause trouble? I'm not sure, but the man behind the grey-haired one. He's the one who injured Illumi. Silva explained. Chapter 44, Silva Zaldik Zebro's eyebrows shot up in surprise. It wasn't every day that someone managed to crack open all those gates. He cast a quick but wary glance at both Raymond and Sakujiro with his mind racing with caution. Normally, if they had just popped a couple of gates, he'd have immediately gone to his post to report to the family butler that some people were coming to cause trouble. But seeing Sakujiro bust through all the way to the seventh gate? Zebro figured the family must already know what was up by now. I've done it, master, Sakujiro announced. His voice was calm as ever as he gave a slight bow. Raymond nodded as he stepped forward with Sakujiro at his side. Do me a favor and stay where you are for now, Raymond instructed Gon and the rest who were visibly shaken with sweat beating on their brows as they nodded in agreement. Raymond's tone was different this time, more like he was giving an order. Everyone sensed the seriousness in his voice. Do you think he's really asking for trouble? Leorio's voice was nervous, and all eyes were on Raymond's back. Karapika shook his head, I'm not sure, but maybe it's best if we stay out of it for now. Gon stayed quiet, clenching his fists tightly. He was eager to see Killua soon but Raymond showing up had messed up his plans to meet him today. Though he was a bit mad at Raymond, Gon knew it wasn't really his fault. He blamed himself for being weak. He was upset with himself, he wished he had the strength to do something about it. If only I were stronger, Gon thought quietly, his eyes burning with determination to improve. Meanwhile, Raymond sensed a group rapidly approaching as they continued forward. A smirk formed on his lips as he stopped, with Sakujiro following suit. They all looked ahead and noticed a bunch of servants in black suits, led by a tall man in his thirties. The man, well dressed in a black suit, slicked back hair and a trimmed beard, wore pointed glasses. Hmm. He seemed a bit taken aback at the sight of Sakujiro but greeted Raymond with a nod as he silently pressed a button under his suit. Welcome to the Zaldik family estate, Gota greeted with a bow, his colleagues following suit. Standing tall again, he introduced himself, I'm Gota, 
responsible for managing the family's external affairs. Apologies for the delay in greeting you. After the gate opened, Gota quickly stepped forward to personally greet the guests. He knew that an apprentice butler wouldn't be able to stop someone who could open all the gates in the testing gates if they came to create trouble. However, Gota couldn't help but feel a bit unsettled when he recognized the person standing behind the young man who appeared to be the leader. It's a good thing we brought back up, Gota mused silently before addressing their guest. We haven't had someone make a request in person for quite a while. Would our esteemed guest mind stating their business through us? Gota inquired politely. Raymond watched with curiosity as he sensed the approach of several others, their presence hidden, unlike Gota and his crew. His attention returned to Gota, realizing those people in the shadows were intentionally revealing their presence as a display of strength. Quite cute, aren't they? This only widened Raymond's smirk. Although Gota tried to phrase it politely, Raymond could read between the lines. They wanted him to leave the family estate. Raymond simply chuckled at the implication. This reaction made Gota's associate visibly tense up, and Gota himself frowned as Raymond glanced around. Without missing a beat, Raymond spoke up, Looks like Zaldik has more butlers than I thought. Those words sent a ripple through the servants lurking in the shadows, who then emerged, surrounding Raymond and Sakujiro. Please, esteemed guests, let's not make this more complicated than it needs to be, Gota pleaded, though his voice was emotionless as if it didn't matter if Raymond did make things difficult for them. Still, it was clear to Gota that Raymond and Sakujiro weren't taking the situation seriously. Oh. Without uttering a word, Raymond sensed a sudden shift in the air. In a flash, Sakujiro vanished from sight before reappearing right in front of Raymond. In Sakujiro's hand gleamed a dagger infused with his nin. Reacting swiftly, Sakujiro swung his arm to intercept the incoming threat aimed at Raymond. A metallic clang resonated through the air, followed by the sight of needles scattering to the ground after the clash. What a warm welcome, Illumi. Raymond remarked with a hint of sarcasm in his tone. In response, Illumi emerged from the woods while holding needles in each hand. His expression was unreadable. Sorry for the trouble, young master. We'll handle this, Gota interjected, his frown deepening as he bowed respectfully to Illumi. Illumi approached Gota, bringing them face to face with Raymond and Sakujiro as a tense atmosphere slowly permeated the scene. You'll get yourself killed if you try. Illumi warned, causing Gota's eyes to widen in realization of the gravity of the situation. I noticed you're in top form today, quite convenient, Raymond remarked, drawing everyone's attention. He chuckled before suggesting, why not chop off an arm to pacify my late subordinate? A heavy silence hung over them, each person trying to decipher the meaning behind the words. Their faces hardened as they realized the guest might be up to no good. They quietly readied themselves channeling their nan and were prepared to attack when necessary. A tense atmosphere settled around them, causing Sakujiro to furrow his brow as he carefully spun his dagger in his hand, preparing for the worst. Illumi remained silent, his emotionless gaze fixed on Raymond. Though internally he was taken aback by Raymond's bold arrival at their estate. Step aside, Sakujiro, Raymond commanded. But... Sakujiro started to protest. Raymond shook his head a silent indication that his decision was final. Understanding it was final, Sakujiro bowed obediently before returning to his position beside Raymond. I'm not expecting this to turn into a family gathering. Guess I'm doing you all a favor, considering these gatherings are rare in Zaldik, right? Raymond's voice cut through the air, echoing around them as he addressed the new arrivals. As a few figures approached, the servants around them bowed respectfully. Was it you who broke Illumi's arm? Silva's tone was devoid of emotion, yet his imposing presence sent a chill down everyone's spine despite his seemingly unaffected demeanor. Chapter 45, Dance of Death In a hallway connected to a peaceful garden, Zeno walked slowly toward the underground tunnel to visit Killua. Hmm. Zeno's brow furrowed in confusion as he halted his steps, a hint of concern flickering across his features. He closed his eyes momentarily as he turned towards the direction of the main gate before he slowly reopened his eyes as a sigh escaping his lips. Looks like trouble's brewing, he muttered, sensing the tension in the air like a gathering storm. Grandpa Zeno. What's going on? A chubby teenager emerged from the underground tunnel, gasping for breath. He had short, neatly trimmed black hair and squinted black eyes. Miluki, meet your father. You know what to do next, Zeno addressed his grandson calmly. Miluki scratched his head, pondering for a moment. Okay. Are you still going to see Killua? Zeno closed his eyes, 
deep in thought, I'll put it off for now. Miluki shook his head and hurried off towards the mansion. Back in the present moment. So, that guy's the one who hurt Iluenii. Miluki's childish voice echoed, oblivious to the tension thickening in the air. Ilumi shot him a glare, but Miluki remained oblivious as he kept pointing his chubby finger at Raymond, you motherfucker, coming here like you've got a death wish. Miluki, zip it. Quit making a scene in front of mother. A woman with an electric visor dressed in an elaborate dark purple gown and a flamboyant hat adorned with feathers, fur, and flowers scolded Miluki, who shrank back nervously while fidgeting his fingers. Sorry, mama. He mumbled sheepishly. Kikyo shook her head, her bandaged face turned towards Raymond. On Kikyo's side, Kalato observed Raymond with curiosity. Silva's expression remained icy, unmoved by Raymond's sarcasm or Miluki's antics. No sense of humor, hey. Raymond sighed while shaking his head. It looks like I've brought a trouble home, Ilumi remarked as he approached his family. Silva briefly glanced at Ilumi before fixing his gaze on Raymond once more, spit it out. Who are you? And do you really think you can leave here in one piece after asking for my son's arm? Isn't it natural since he killed someone crucial to my interests in your new city? He's like my left-hand man there, so it's only reasonable for Ilumi to hand over his left hand in return, right? Raymond nonchalantly shrugged. Silence hung heavy, and even Sakujiro found himself a bit lost for words. He couldn't help but marvel at how bold his master could be at times. He shook his head, staying watchful. Ha ha ha, very well. A wave of oppressive energy emanated from Silva's imposing figure, his laughter slicing through the tense atmosphere like a razor. The sheer force of his nonsense shivers down the spines of all around as they struggled to maintain composure in the face of such overwhelming power. Sweat glistened on their brows as they fought to keep their fear at bay, their hearts pounding with the weight of Silva's aura bearing down upon them. But just as they began to adjust to the suffocating pressure, another surge of energy descended upon them, equally potent and unyielding. All eyes turned to Raymond, the center of this new equally overbearing pressure as realization dawned upon them. He's, he's strong. Gota exclaimed in his mind as he immediately channeled his own and to shield himself from a collision of power emanating from Silva and Raymond. The clouds above churned ominously, mirroring the turmoil below as the very sky darkened in response to the ferocity of their confrontation. Ilumi watched in silence as he had anticipated Raymond's powerful nun. Kikyo looked grave while Kalato sought shelter behind her. Realizing he had spoken rashly to someone who could rival his father's nun, Miluki appeared scared and hid behind Kikyo alongside Kalato. Kikyo glanced at her son with exasperation before smacking Miluki on his head, causing him to flinch. Do you have any sense at all? To think you'd dare to ask for something like that in front of me. Silva's voice continued to echo through the tense air as he walked forward. With a swift motion, he extended his arm, and in an instant, his form vanished into thin air. Raymond remained silent, his own figure disappearing in response. Boom. Then, a deafening explosion reverberated through the space as both men reappeared, locked in a clash of titans. Silva's fist surged forward with deadly intent but Raymond's reflexes were razor-sharp as he intercepted the blow with a block, the impact resonating with a thunderous force. In retaliation, Raymond launched a fierce kick, aiming for Silva's back. Yet, Silva was equally prepared, his defense solid as he deflected the attack with a well-timed maneuver. Their collision unleashed a shockwave that rippled outward, threatening to tear through everything in its path. What in the world? The servants scrambled to retreat, their eyes wide with disbelief as they witnessed the spectacle unfolding before them. Silva was forced to step back as Raymond was also similarly forced to take a step back, creating some distance between them. The air crackled with the residual aura of their clash. His raw strength rivals Sakujiro's, no, he's even stronger. Raymond's mind raced with exhilaration and disbelief, his body thrumming with the adrenaline of battle. Despite the pain pulsating through his body, he couldn't help but feel a surge of invigoration coursing through his veins as his face contorted into a crazed smirk. On Silva's end, he recognized that he had the upper hand in terms of raw strength. The young man before him, who was around the same age as his son Alumi actually possessed superior technique. No wonder he managed to best Alumi, Silva thought, a crazed grin spreading across his face as he acknowledged the formidable opponent standing before him. Hey! However, when he saw a similar grin mirrored on Raymond's face, Silva was caught off guard. Ha 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 ha! The laughter bubbled forth from deep within their souls. Silva's heart raced with anticipation, his blood pumping with the thrill of the hunt. For him, 
the thought of facing a formidable opponent he needed to kill was a source of pure ecstasy. Similarly, Raymond's pulse quickened with excitement, his senses heightened by the adrenaline coursing through his veins. For him, the thrill of battle was an addiction. Though their nature was different, both Silva and Raymond recognized the undeniable fact between them. We're of the same kind. The realization hung in the air like a vow. This is exciting. Raymond's voice echoed with exhilaration as he vanished into thin air, his form melding seamlessly with Silva's as they continued their dance of death. Chapter 49, Chapter 46, We Must Eliminate Him What on earth? Leorio blurted out, sensing a sudden surge of intense pressure emanating from the estate. Gon and Karapika felt it as well while Zebro furrowed his brows. Head to the gatepost. It's not safe here for you youngsters, Zebro advised with concern. Karapika and Gon acknowledged the warning, understanding that the confrontation between Raymond and the Zaldik family had begun. They proceeded to the gatepost and sat down in silence. Do you think Raymond will survive this? Gon couldn't help but voice his concern as he already saw Raymond as a friend. Karapika and Leorio exchanged uncertain glances, unsure of the true strength of the entire Zaldik family. Or whether Raymond was strong enough to take them on. Zebro shook his head. He couldn't help but think. Zaldik won't allow anyone to walk away after stirring up this much trouble. However, he kept his thoughts to himself, especially considering the individual from earlier seemed familiar with the kids. Let's hope things turn out okay, Karapika said softly, gazing at the once clear sky now becoming overcast with dark clouds. Back on the battlefield. Silva unleashed a powerful kick, his leg descending with powerful force as Raymond evaded by leaping backwards with remarkable agility. Boom. The impact cratered the ground beneath them, a testament to the sheer power behind Silva's attack. Yet, Silva's assault didn't end there. With unparalleled speed, his form blurred as he traversed the battlefield before reappearing in an instant before Raymond. His hand, pulsating with veins and razor-sharp nails, shot forward in a swift jab aimed directly at Raymond's chest. Raymond remained resolute, his instincts guiding him as he sidestepped Silva's jab with a grace born of experience. This guy. His mind raced as he assessed the situation. Silva was definitely powerful. He was stronger than Hisoka, faster than Illumi, and had a set of superior fighting technique to both. Closing the distance between them, Raymond countered with a sharp kick aimed at Silva's neck. Silva swiftly raised his hand to intercept the attack, frustration evident in the crease of his brow as he braced for the impact. The longer they fought, the more he felt like punching the air. Raymond seemed to be able to read his move with precision. Father. On your left. Illumi's urgent cry pierced through the chaos, alerting Silva to the imminent danger. Wah. Wide-eyed, Silva followed his son's warning, only to find Raymond's smirking figure disappearing from his sight. In a blink, Raymond reappeared on Silva's vulnerable left side, his fist hurtling towards Silva's face with alarming velocity. Caught off guard by the sudden move, Silva had little time to react as Raymond's punch connected with staggering force, sending him staggering backwards. Silva's breath hitched as the impact rippled through his body. Meanwhile, the Zaldik family members and their servants watched in stunned silence, and their eyes widened in disbelief as the scene unfolded before them. Silva's figure crashed through the ground, with the earth quaking beneath the force of his fall. Yet, with an impressive display of resilience, he rose from his knees. It has been a long time since the last time someone gave me a clean punch, Silva's hand instinctively reached to touch the side of his face where Raymond's punch had landed the sting of the blow still lingering. Despite the pain coursing through him, Silva remained composed, his gaze fixed upon Raymond as he slowly opened his mouth, You. You, purposely slowed yourself down since the beginning, hey. He was Silva Zaldik. The current patriarch of the Zaldsik family. The audacity of someone daring to manipulate the pace of their confrontation against him was unfathomable. Illumi felt a wave of shock wash over him. Even though his expression was emotionless, his fists clenched involuntarily. Deep down, he understood that Raymond had deliberately restrained himself a while ago. Illumi knew should Raymond choose to do so. The guy could end his life in an instant. The realization struck Illumi to his core, a blow to his pride as a predator. The tables had turned, and now he found himself feeling like prey, vulnerable and exposed in the presence of a being of a higher food chain. What a madman, ha 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 ha. Silva's laughter resonated his excitement was palpable as he felt adrenaline coursing through his body at the prospect of killing his opponent. With each chuckle, Silva's aura intensified, pulsating with the raw energy of his nan. 
His gaze bore into Raymond with intense curiosity. Tell me, what else are you hiding? Silva's voice boomed, eager to uncover the depths of Raymond's abilities. Raymond merely smirked in response. His movements seemed casual as he discarded his blazer, letting it fall carelessly to the ground. With a fluid motion, he unbuttoned his shirt, revealing the muscular form beneath. This is about to get sweaty. Raymond muttered under his breath, his voice carrying a hint of amusement. As his words hung in the air, a surge of formidable and erupted from Raymond, dwarfing even Silva's powerful aura. The sheer magnitude of it sent a shiver down Silva's spine, his expression hardening as sweat beaded on his brow. Master, do you really need to go this far? Secujiro looked at Raymond, who stood amidst a swirling storm of the terrifying nun with a concerned expression. Raymond closed his eyes briefly, then reopened them, revealing a pair of crimson orbs that glowed with an ominous hue. Seasoned by decades of life as an assassin, Silva immediately sensed the impending threat. A shiver ran down his spine as he felt the hairs on his neck stand on end the moment those crimson eyes locked onto him. In a decisive move, Silva turned to his family and servants, step back. This is beyond your capacity. With a sense of urgency, Silva urged his families and servants to retreat. Silva's thoughts raced as he looked at Raymond in silence. His gaze flicked briefly towards their mansion. Why haven't they come out? Raymond's presence should have alerted these old fossils. Despite his usual excitement for battle, Silva couldn't ignore the gravity of the situation. Raymond's overwhelming power sparked a mix of anticipation and concern within him. Silva wanted at least Zeno would come and help since he now wanted assurance. An assurance that they could finish off this enemy right in front of his very eyes without leaving him any chance of escaping. This young man. Silva's eyes narrowed as he observed Raymond's deliberate advance. A steely resolve settled within him as he reached a sobering conclusion. We must eliminate him at all costs. Chapter 50, Chapter 47, Surrounded A vivid crimson hue enveloped everything, reflecting the color of his gaze as time seemed to slow down in Raymond's perception, with his thoughts completely accelerated. Raymond shook his head after seeing Silva's expression. He could roughly tell what Silva was thinking. That's why I dislike assassins. He muttered to himself as he slowly made his way toward Silva. Both of their figures suddenly disappeared before their collision, creating another resounding shockwave. As the fierce battle raged on, Silva's heart sank with dread. Raymond had seemingly transcended his previous limits, becoming even faster and more adept at countering Silva's attacks. With a sharp evasion, Silva narrowly avoided Raymond's onslaught before retreating to a safe distance. But Raymond showed no mercy, closing the gap with alarming speed. In a flash, he materialized behind Silva, unleashing a devastating whirlwind kick aimed squarely at Silva's exposed back. The impact sent Silva hurtling towards the ground with alarming velocity, his body crashing into the earth with bone-shattering force. A deep crater formed upon impact, with Silva at its center, a testament to the sheer power of Raymond's assault. Tell me, who are you? Silva rose from the crater with an air of nonchalance, his demeanor unaffected by Raymond's earlier assault. His expression remained sharp and focused, undeterred by the force of the attack. Without a word, Raymond continued his onslaught with a swift kick as he materialized above Silva with lightning speed. Rude brat. Silva's brow furrowed in response as he leaped into the air to avoid the attack. Silva opened up his hand and his hand suddenly glowing with swirling chaotic orbs of an energy. As Silva prepared to merge the orbs into a single, devastating attack, his concentration was shattered. Raymond appeared before him instantly blocking Silva's hand with uncanny precision. With a jolt of realization, Silva's eyes widened in alarm. But his reflexes were swift, and as Raymond launched another kick, Silva retaliated with a powerful thrust of his own. His foot connected with Raymond's chest, sending him hurtling toward the ground like a meteor. Raymond crashed into the earth with incredible force, carving out yet another crater on the battlefield. Time to meet your end. Silva's voice boomed his hand clenched into a menacing fist as he was about to combine the orbs to create an explosion aimed at Raymond. Yet, Raymond's response was a sinister chuckle as he calmly issued a warning, you might want to reconsider your position. Silva's heart raced with apprehension, but before he could react, a wave of dread washed over him. His eyes widened in disbelief as he felt the connection with the orbs he had conjured slipping away. In horror, Silva glanced at the hand Raymond had restrained earlier, sensing a dark aura disrupting the flow of his energy. Before he could react, the orbs exploded with a deafening roar, engulfing Silva in a maelstrom of destruction. Papa! Miloki's worried cry reverberated through the air. 
Kikyo's expression twisted with worry as she uttered a single word, husband. In the heavy silence that ensued, Ilumi's unwavering gaze remained fixed on Raymond. Meanwhile, Raymond slowly rose to his feet, spitting out a mouthful of blood, while Kalato observed with stronger interest. As the dust settled, Silva's battered form emerged, consumed by the aftermath of his own attack. With a resounding thud, he collapsed to the ground, sinking to his knees as he expelled a mouthful of blood before he wiped his bloody mouth with his hand. Sakujiro swiftly reached Raymond's side, concern etched on his face as he inquired, Are you all right, master? I'm good. Raymond's response was accompanied by the ominous gleam in his crimson eyes. Despite his assurance, a sharp pain throbbed in his chest from Silva's earlier assault. It's good that I've been dodging his attack since the beginning or else I might be in a worse shape, Raymond mused, shaking his head at the realization. Blocking Silva's attack head-on would have been a perilous gamble, given the sheer raw power emanating from Silva's blows. Silent contemplation enveloped Raymond as he looked at Sakujiro, who had arrived uninvited. Despite his unspoken disapproval, Raymond refrained from berating his loyal subordinate since they had a new guest. Together, Raymond and Sakujiro turned their attention towards a particular spot in the mist-shrouded woods. The air grew tense as slow, deliberate footsteps echoed through the forest, imposing a temporary halt on their intense battle. As the figure emerged from the swirling mist, Silva's eyes flashed with a sharp light as his gaze locked onto the newcomer. Father. Silva's voice trembled slightly as he spoke feeling a surge of blood rising in his throat once more. He grimaced and spat out another mouthful of blood. Zeno regarded his son with a sigh, Are you all right? I can keep going. Father, let's team up. We gotta take him out, no matter what. Silva declared as he slowly got back on his feet. Despite the searing pain coursing through his body, Silva's countenance remained stoic. They needed to kill Raymond. His resolve was unwavering. Zeno Zaldik it is a pleasure to finally meet you face to face. Your reputation precedes you. Raymond's voice was calm as he emerged from the crater, with Sakujiro shadowing him closely. Zeno's gaze locked onto Raymond's crimson eyes, which burned with an ominous intensity. Surveying the battlefield, he noted the lingering presence of a foreign man, its energy devouring Silva's familiar aura. I don't usually involve myself in these matters, but these presents around us have been unsettling me. Wouldn't you agree, young man? Recalling the warnings about the existence of a formidable young man from Netero, Zeno furrowed his brow as he couldn't help but think that this young man in front of him might be the one. Sakujiro's pupils quivered at these words. A rustling sound enveloped the Zaldik estate, and a multitude of ominous presences gradually revealed themselves. Birds scattered in panic, and the sky darkened, adding an eerie atmosphere to the unfolding events. Hmm. Silva's eyes widened in shock as he sensed a formidable presence enveloping their estate spreading throughout the surrounding mountains. Tension gripped every member of the Zaldik family present, sending shivers down their spines. Even Gotha and the Zaldik family servants paled at the overwhelming aura. Raymond's brow furrowed at the disturbance, and he raised his voice, commanding, Halt! At his command, the rustling sounds ceased abruptly, and the mysterious presence faded away, leaving the mountain shrouded in silence once more. I apologize. I didn't intend to bring additional company today. It appears my subordinates were overly concerned for my well-being. Raymond shook his head, casting a brief glance towards Sakujiro, who bowed apologetically. Thanks for listening.